Hello, and welcome to the Shea Hates Everything podcast, where we talk about video games, movies, comics, and other shit that matters. My name is Shay, and today I hate my daughter being sick and also getting me sick. And my name is Kyle, and today I hate me being sick. <laughs> it's that time of year where it's like getting closer to the fall, and so the weather is changing just a little bit, and like there's all the extra particles in the air. It's just, this is this is the time. When people get their first fall colds. It's a Um, wonderful time of year. It's when all of the crystals become negatively charged. Oh, is that what it is? I have no idea. I'm making that up. (laughs) It's probably a thing somewhere on the internet. No, but obviously we are a week late on this podcast. Uh, I was put up very hardcore last weekend. So kind of the course of action. My daughter got her first cold, and it was incredibly heartbreaking because her face is all swollen, and she can't blow her nose, and she doesn't consciously cough because she doesn't know how to do that stuff yet, and so she keeps all the congestion pressure in her head, so her eyes were, like, watering all the time because of all the pressure. We had to take an instrument that goes up her nose, and you suck out the snot. Yeah, the bulbs. No, it's you actually put it in your mouth and oh, suck dude. it out. No. There's a filter that prevents it from going into your mouth, but it is still that sounds unbelievably like disgusting. I don't trust it. It is <laughs> disgusting. It's super popular. It's really successful. It works. It totally works, but it's gross. So she got sick. That was a rough two days of us taking care of her. And then, obviously... I got sick from it because when babies get sick, they call them super colds because they have no immune system. And so the virus just runs amok in there and like gets more powerful and like goes super saiyan. And so it is it gets you more sick. So I had a terrible cold while she was still sick, which was really awful. Last Saturday, my daughter was sick. I was sick and I had her by myself all day long when my wife is at work was a rough fucking day. And then two days later, my wife started showing symptoms. So at least like the best news is once my wife started showing symptoms, my daughter was pretty much through it. And so she, my wife was able to take care of me. I started feeling better right as my wife was getting the worst of it. So then I was able to take care of her. So at least we weren't all miserable at the same time, but it was still, uh, it was a long, like 10 days of all three of us being sick. And I'm still very, congested and stuff was uh how how was how's how was your cold treating you uh so mine i actually had a fever um for like a day and a half Mm -hmm. which is not atypical for me usually when i get fevers it's only for like a day and i guess just my body like fights it off or something um but i i missed i probably didn't have to miss friday work but i was like "Mm, borderlands (laughs) is out so (laughs) just gonna quote unquote still be sick but Mm -hmm. yeah so i missed three days of work wednesday thursday friday of this past week um yeah it was not fun it was uh, like a headache sinus stuff a little bit of a fever shaky but i'm fine now yes i am i mean obviously the congestion is still annoying i have a little bit of a cough my wife still has a bit of her cough but it was, yeah, it's, I mean, colds are never fun, obviously. When you can just stay at home by yourself and get some chicken noodle soup or some Sprite or whatever, ginger ale, whatever it is that helps you, it's not the worst. Like, if you're not, if you don't feel like you're going to die, you can just sit home and watch movies, whatever. But having to take care of my kid, that's what made it so much worse. Because I'm just, it drained and exhausted and I feel like garbage and I still have to function normally. It was brutal. But we also went over to uh, in-laws to watch football because football started. And it would have been a lot more fun if I wasn't sick because I was just miserable sitting there on the couch. Like, I didn't want to talk to people. It was yeah, it's a long weekend, <laughs> which is not what weekends should be. Weekends should be about recharging for the next work week. And it wasn't. But because but you got it's out of been, the way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. As if I'm not going to get another cold in the fall or winter. I don't know. Usually um, for me, it's like a one and done. And then I, it's something usually happens at the beginning of spring for me as well. It's impossible to foresee just because of our daughter. We have no idea. She could get sick all the time. Yeah. And it, when she gets sick, we're going to get sick. That's the reality. Kids are 
disgusting disease monsters. It's only yeah. going to get worse. I work in a school, Shay. I'm oh, yeah. perfectly aware of how disgusting yeah, they are. They're the yes. reason why I get sick every year. Yeah. But it's getting better each year. It's like less... It's it, like the symptoms are better and mm. it doesn't take as long every year. It's my fourth year. So <laughs> it's getting better. You're slowly building up that immune system exactly. to work. I'm going to be a superhuman by the end. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> uh, but because it was three weeks gives us more time to have played stuff. More stuff came out. Surprisingly, yeah. not not as much news as I would have anticipated over a three week period. But that's OK, because we have plenty of stuff to talk about that we've been playing. Number one on the list, obviously, is Borderlands 3. Just came out a couple days ago. Uh, you're much farther in it than I am because, as I've said multiple times, I get basically two hours a week to play video games. I was able to start a game solo and play for about 30 minutes on Saturday. And then uh, you, Cody, and I synced up and played for about a, an hour and a half co-op. Yeah. Um, it's a good chunk of time. All three of us are playing Flack, the Beastmaster, as our solo character. Yeah. And so none of us are playing him in the co-op. I'm playing Amara, the Siren. And you're doing, what's his name? I don't know. It's the so- Soldier Boy. Yeah, but he's more of a tech class than he is yeah. a soldier class. Like, he has yeah. the shield, but he has the drone and the, right. the decoy thing. He has a lot of cool powers. Yeah. And then Cody's playing Moe's the, with the big mech. Um, yeah, that so was yeah, really that, cool in co-op because you were able to like yes, when he right on the, the back mech, of it. you were able to hop on the turret in the back, which is really yeah. neat. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so I mean, you're you're in your solo game. You're like level sixteen, I think, ish. Yeah, fifteen or sixteen. And in the, in, I mean, in in my single player, I just hit level two. Like like I said, I played a half hour, so I barely uh, touched the surface. And then in our co-op, we've we gotten past six, the opening area. Yeah, we're leveling up much, much faster in co-op, yeah. uh, especially when three of us were playing when Cody joined a little bit late. Yeah, but, I think um, it's because like there's there's more enemies since mm-hmm. we're in co-op, or maybe it's that the enemies are harder, so they give us more XP. They're I definitely harder, yeah. So... Um, so what's been your impression so far? It's hard. It's a little hard for me to say from the co-op because we're all chit-chatting the whole time, so I'm not really paying attention to what the actual quests are and stuff. Yeah. So you'd have a better gauge uh, on that. I think the writing is pretty much on par for Borderlands. It's mostly... Hit or miss. Mostly, yeah. Mostly cringy. Yeah, most, I would say mostly miss, but the when it hits, it hits really well. Right. Um, it's a lot of pop culture, funny, stupid references like the Beastmaster, Flack... When there's a, he has one of his abilities is to like throw his hand out in two racks. The flying monsters will spawn from his hand, and they'll like fly at enemies and like attack them for a quick hit. Um, and when he does that, he goes pocket racks like a pocket sand joke. Mm-hmm. Which the first time I'd been playing for probably four hours before I realized that was the joke that he was making. Um, so it kind of didn't have quite as good of an effect on me as it should have i should have realized it instantly but um yeah i don't know it's it's strange because in borderlands you're used to like not a silent protagonist but cert like very rarely does your character speak up and say anything and so it didn't really feel like it always felt like you were playing yourself uh in borderlands which has its own merits but in this one your character is very very chatty let's say Mm -hmm. like during combat with conversations with other characters and quests and stuff i feel like my character's always got something to say which is kind of nice uh it uh i mean granted i'm still early but my experience with that hasn't been as awesome because flack i think is a pretty flat personality character yeah he's a robot. and amara who i'm playing as well she also comes across pretty flat and um very buttoned up because i mean i don't know i hardly know anything about the character yet but it seems like her backstory is very regal sort of okay. thing so she's just kind of uptight um which obviously allows for opportunities for the other characters to interact yeah and them kind of steal the show with the jokiness but the the character my character talking while i'm playing has not been my favorite aspect of the game. Right. And the thing I've noticed is that they didn't record multiple lines of dialogue for most of the uh, NPCs in the world. So like when your character says something, it's going to have to play into what the NPCs next line is. Even, even if you're playing one of the other four characters, like all of your, the player characters lines for the four different characters play 
or follow the same thread so that the NPCs don't have to record multiple lines. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that as well. Um, but it, it works out fine most of the time. Um, yeah, yeah. So writing hit or miss like it's always been. Um, I think the game looks how you remember Borderlands looking. Which means it probably looks a lot better than previous. Oh, Borderlands well, it totally games. does. <laughs> I mean, we we played Borderlands one not too long ago. Yeah, we played Borderlands true. two. This game is miles and miles ahead. Yeah, it looks like a current, like it looks like a PlayStation four version of Borderlands. Right. It's not the most amazing looking game because of the cell shaded nature, the big right. open world. It's some yeah. of the polygons are like not the best, but it it is much improved over previous Borderlands games. Yeah. I think. and I get like you and I and Cody were playing on PS four, so. Yep. Um, not PC or, or Xbox. So and it's I did still, have HDR on, turned on. Okay, I'm playing on the launch PS4, and it still runs mm-hmm. and looks great, which sure. I think is worth mentioning at this yeah. late in the cycle. Um, because there, as a game I'm about to talk about, uh, in a little bit, some games maybe don't run on consoles all that well. Uh, but this one does. So I also like one of the big differentiators for me in terms of like helping keep it fresh and make it feel like a new title and not just more Borderlands is like just the guns. Like I feel like they finally made good on the promise of bajillions of guns. Mm, um, yes, absolutely. Because like in the previous couple Borderlands, it was just kind of like the first Borderlands, it, there were a, a few guns uh, and just kind of rolling numbers and random effects. And the second one, you had a couple of unique weapons here or there, and they really kind of doubled down on, like, how each brand kind of has their own specialties and things like that and mm-hmm. styles. But in this one, it's like that to the nth degree. I mean, there are so many variations of weapons. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. They even added, like, another brand of weapon um, with that is like belongs to the enemy faction of the big bad in the game. Yeah. Uh, big bads. Yeah. Uh, and those are those are interesting because they they like overheat. They still use ammo, but instead of reloading, they just overheat, and you have to let them cool off. Um, but they always have like ginormous clip sizes um, because of that, which is interesting. <laughs> but and they have like their own kind of like cobbled together look, raidery look. Um, yeah, and, and then How, I, have I, you like, seen... there are more types of vehicles, but they still control. In that like, not awesome way, right? In in a, in a <laughs> they have like the halo control method where yeah. you push up on the stick to go forward and you kind of steer where you are looking, which is mm-hmm. not good for driving and shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, it just like I find myself a lot of the times like trying to drive around with the left stick, like turn with the left stick. Yeah, it, that does not work. It's forward and back on the left, and then you have to look to turn. Um. There, there might what be a you, setting to change that, but... What have you thought of the different environments? Or I guess, like, have you seen other planets and stuff yet? Yeah, so I'm on my way to the third planet now, mm-hmm. and, like, the, the first two planets are vastly different. They kind of start you off in a wasteland-y... Well, yeah, um, you're on it's Pandora. Pandora. So yeah, it's, where all the other games have taken more place. more Pandora, and it's familiar. Yeah. And by the time I had finished that, finished that area, I was like, man, this really is more Borderlands. But then I right. got to the next planet... And just, like, the style of the level design and the environment is very, very different. The types of enemies you're facing there, completely different. Even, like, the raiders and stuff, they kind of reflect that new surrounding. Um, cool. Which is neat. So they clearly, like, they put a lot of work into differentiating the environment. So I'm excited to see what the third area looks like. But um, that that has really helped keep it fresh. Uh, and a- as you go through the story, you're, you're meeting familiar faces and like new and funny or weird ways and stuff like that. So it's kind of like a, there, there's a little bit of a who's who element uh, to it as well, which is kind of fun um, for people who've been playing the franchise. But um, yeah, it's, I don't know. It, it's good. I'm really, I'm enjoying my time. I feel like I'm getting way more guns than I ever have in a Borderlands game, which sure. is really kind of slowing me down a bit. Um, yeah. Uh, they have some really good quality of life improvements just in terms of the inventory and how um, how you can like compare stats on weapons and, and how they surface all that information I think is just a little bit better this time around. Uh, there's also like a lot of fast travel options and shortcuts mm-hmm. for buttons so you don't have to go into menus to do certain things and it's it's smart 
like they clearly listened to a lot of the complaints of people playing hundreds of hours of Borderlands one and two, and they uh, came up with some smart, small quality of life fixes for that stuff, which just um, kind of helps streamline the experience a bit, which is yeah. important because it, I'm, at its core, it is more Borderlands, and so I absolutely. think you do need to have that element of simplification in terms of a lot of the interface. Um, yes, I, I I am a bit of too much like. It being just more Borderlands, because make no mistake, this is just more Borderlands. Like, there are no big departures. Being able to go to different planets and stuff, you have a kind of a home hub ship. Like, all of that is cool, but, like, the moment-to-moment and even, like, a thousand feet up view, this is just more Borderlands. Yeah. For me, and I know for you, it's been since, what, 2012, 2013 when Borderlands 2 came out? Right. It's been plenty long enough, and I'm not counting the pre-sequel because that game sucked. But it's been plenty long enough that that is okay with me. A, right. a current gen Borderlands with more stuff, that's totally fine. And therefore, all of the quality of life improvements seem more meaningful and are more important because it is just more Borderlands. Right. But I don't know what I don't know what it would be, but there is a part of me that wishes they would have done something to up level the game. Like to make it feel more modern. Like, I don't know. It, it's it's I'm right on that line because I love that they stuck to their guns and made more like they didn't make it like um, they didn't try to make it Grand Theft Auto. They didn't try to make it Destiny. You know what I mean? Like they didn't try to adapt Borderlands framework into the modern style of game. But I do wish they would have maybe done something that's a little bit more or a little bit different. I don't know. I'm not sure where I fall yet. I'm sure once I play a lot more of it, I'll discover if more Borderlands really is enough. Like, do I really want to put 40 more hours across two different characters into yet another Borderlands game? I, I'm not quite sure yet, but yeah. I am having fun so far. Um, yeah, yeah, same. Another thing that um, they've kind of done is they populated the world with kind of these, like, points of interest that you don't know about until you like go into the area and so Mm. one of them might be like a dead claptrap you need to go harvest his body so you can give like the claptrap back on the ship some parts or something for himself or 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 his room or whatever um and then like there are other like you're shutting down broadcast centers so that moxie can like broadcast her stuff instead of the children of the vault stuff and um so there's there's like a few and yeah, I don't know if I want more of them, but I, it's just it's a nice little extra dash of salt, right? A little okay. extra flavor um, running around the world. Just a couple extra things to do that are different, um, that have you playing in a different way. It's not just point A, point B. You know, you get there, sure. you got to look for it, got to figure out how to get to it to get to the thing. And sometimes there's platforming puzzles. Sometimes it's like you got to shoot a thing or you got to fight something before you can get to it and other stuff like that. So, um I also, like, randomly came across, it was kind of, like, back behind this rock, I noticed, because they, what they do is they kind of, like, splatter yellow paint on places where you can climb, because uh, oh, okay. you, you can clamber in this game now. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I, I was, like, driving out somewhere on Pandora in one of the big areas, and I noticed there was a little bit of yellow paint on this wall, this rock ledge, so I climbed it, and as soon as I climbed it, like, this a special creature spawned and then hammerlock was on the radio like hey i need you to like hunt this thing down for me and i'll give you whatever if you do it and so i've gotten this this random mini boss boss, battle out in the wasteland from this like special creature and had this little encounter that was kind of cool and so like if the game has more surprises like that which i believe it probably does um that's exciting too because then it's not just running to a mission board and then running to totally. where the diamond is on the map, doing a thing and running back, you know? I Another small criticism. I am still having difficulty comparing weapons at a glance because yeah. there are so many different stats, man. Like, there are, like, eight different stats on every gun of the damage and the efficiency and the ammo size, like, all that stuff. Plus, every gun has three to four to eight status effect things on it like right, oh, it yeah. now they have damage like, the as fire zoom modes and, and like those like when i when i hover over a gun i am overwhelmed with data 
and I'll, oh, some of the stuff's red, some of it's green, some of it's white, and I, it's really, really hard to parse. Is this gun actually better than the one that I'm using already? Which makes it even more difficult when you're comparing different gun types. Because if I have right. a pistol and it's a submachine gun, I have no idea other than just the base damage number. Is this gun better? And so because I'm still early on in both... Um, playthroughs i don't care that much about that right now once you play more and you're getting more rares and legendaries that i think is going to have a much bigger impact and maybe i'll just have to take more time in menus to look at guns and find guns and and like gun manufacturers because that is a benefit that all the manufacturers have things that are intrinsic to that manufacturer so you can find out oh i really like the jacobs weapons or oh i really like the tdr weapons because of what all of them do so maybe once I just have more time in the game, that, that'll feel better. But right now, it's just like... Like, I'm not willing to spend the time comparing six different guns that I just picked up. I'm just going to pick one of the pistols. I don't care. So... Right. In well, a game that, that is all about game, guns... It's, that early in the game is pretty negligible anyways. Yes, um, totally. And, and typically, what I have found is that most of the weapons that you pick up are... Like, all of the white weapons that you pick up are going to be around a similar thing for your level. All of the well, yeah. green weapons, all the blue weapons, all the purple weapons, they're all going to be around a... It really it comes down to, for me, what I've noticed more in, like, the special effects of the weapons. Mm -hmm. I don't care as much about the damage. I care about, like, the alt fires or the, yeah. the uh, elements that are available or, like what kind of zooms they have. Because if there's, like, a pistol that would be really good and it, fa it fires fast, but it has a huge scope on it, like, I right. don't want to, like, no. So right. that's more what it comes down to for me because in the in the long run, if you're going to try and min-max your damage, they're all close enough that you can make up for any slight, um, uh, any uh, slight amount of, uh, oh, God. If the damage is just a little less than another gun, you can make up for it by shooting well. Um, sure. If you like the other effects. So, and I'm at a point where ammo isn't really a concern either because I've bought enough of the, like, inventory upgrades. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it. it's, I think it's, it's very good. They made a lot of smart improvements. And, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, I, I don't know what it would be. I don't know what kind of a change they would have to make to like freshen it up to where they would, it would still have the same kind of spirit, uh, and kind of core loop. I don't know. I, I'm I'm happy with the way it is. Oh I, yeah, I totally am too. I guess honestly, it's more about like a Borderlands Four. When and if they were to make a Borderlands Four, if yeah. they took another six years and ju and made this game with a with more quality of life improvements and it looked even better. Yeah, is that going that, to be is enough? that enough? And probably I do not. not I don't think so. Yeah. But in Borderlands 3, I think it probably is enough. Uh and without having a specific idea of what else I would like to see, it's really hard to leverage like criticism against the game when I don't even have like I don't even know what I want. But it is there is a little bit of that like I wonder what else they could have done. I don't know. Yeah. And I, I will also say they have a lot of menu options to, like, kind of customize your experience, like, anywhere from, like, reticles and stuff to, like, how your HUD is displayed, how the minimap acts. Like, I mean, there's there are a lot of personalization options uh, in the menus. So if you get the game, take some time to look through those and then don't don't forget about them. Like, remember to like, if you're not liking something, there's probably a menu option for it. Um, yeah. which is something I need to be better about is going back into the menus. But, um, but yeah, Borderlands three, it's, it's good stuff. It is good. It, it feel, it, it feels a little like home. Totally. There's, there's a lot of nostalgia attached to playing through this. In a year where most of my gaming experiences have been utterly disappointing, right. when I think about Kingdom Hearts 3 and Rage yeah. 2 in particular, I know this game is good. I won't, I've played yeah. for a total of two hours, and I know it's good. I know I'm going to have a great time with it, and that is a big sigh of relief, <laughs> to be yeah. honest with you. <laughs> right. Especially with so. all the like 
the shit with Randy Pitchford and totally. The, well, that that stuff is so separated and, from the actual game. Like, I yeah, just, but it, it's just nice to see that that didn't affect the development, at least not enough. in a way that you can see in the end product. Yeah, so that's what I'm happy about. Uh, another game that we have both played. The Dark Pictures Man of Medan. Mm. Oh, Black Betty. Man I, of Medan. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I forgot about that. I, I didn't. I was trying to look and make sure that we didn't talk about it last podcast, but we didn't. Okay. So um, I'm playing through. My wife is watching. Again, we only played one little session that was probably an hour to an hour and a half long. Um, how far did you and Kara get? Oh, um, I mean, I don't want to say. But like, did you play for more than an hour or two? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Probably like so you, you guys are definitely two and a half, three us hours. Then. Okay. Um, we so hmm. Until Dawn was such a huge surprise, and that game that was my number three game of the year that it came out. I loved that game, and I couldn't believe it because it was a horror game. It was very tropey. It was just a it's pretty straightforward, simple adventure game, like. But something about it, it was all those things mashed together, was just so awesome. Men of Medan has not, it doesn't have that surprise element that Until Dawn had, because right. obviously we're expecting it, we're looking forward to it. It also, I think, suffers from um, potentially budget. And I have to imagine that when you think about the dark pictures, they're like anthology that they're making. They have more money to invest than they did in until Dawn because until Dawn was such a success, but maybe because this is a smaller scale game than it being a full $60 game on its own. Part of what made until Dawn work so well was that borderline uncanny Valley where the characters and their, their animations and reactions were so realistic that it felt often like you were watching you know, a shitty horror movie, because that's what the game was trying to do, was trying to play with those tropes. And this, the graphics do not hold up to what they need to be able to do to convey that sense of emotion that Until Dawn was able to. And that is, like, so intrinsic to the experience of the game that if it takes you out of, like, ooh, that character animation looks really bad, or, oh, that face is really shiny and china doll looking right. it totally breaks the immersion of this atmosphere that they're trying to build for me so that's it's usually been the like, teeth yeah well and the eyes too the eyes is the biggest part which yeah. no game will ever be able to capture that because eyes you cannot replicate real person people's eyes at the window of the soul as they say but it's i mean the animations in until dawn were able to overcome the like cheesy overacting and that's part of what made it charming but with this because the animations aren't great the cheesy bad acting and writing just feel like cheesy bad acting and writing they yeah. don't, they're not they don't feel elevated in any way uh yeah and when that's all your game has like there is very little gameplay in these games and when so much of it is hinging on great character facial animations and you fail at that basically what i'm trying to say is i'm not at all liking man of madan <laughs> madan what um i think like there are i think there's still things to enjoy about it like i'm still interested in, in like the mystery and kind of like the blend between the physical threats and the supernatural threats and kind of how I mean, those are I, resolve but i kind of have figured out or at least i think what the the reality behind the fantasy is because none of it is actual horror, like made up shit. Cause then like an until dawn, there was an actual explanation for everything. Cause that's how good horror works. I think I have already figured out what the actual explanation is in this game, which is a little bit annoying. Well, it if, was like, if you like the aren't first... as far as I am, then you might be missing or again, like our playthroughs could be vastly different, but something happened that leads me to believe that there is an actual supernatural element and not just explained away by a very obvious thing that they kind of showcase in well, like the yeah. flashback thing. Cause it's yeah, that, that opening sequence flashback in world war two or whatever, where they're transporting some sort of chemical. Right. And then everybody goes crazy and he sees a bunch of scary shit and it's like, okay, well it's the chemical leaked and is making people hallucinate. Yeah. But there's, there's duh. also like actual supernatural stuff going on. All right, I we'll think see. we'll see. Cause that's the thing is there wasn't any supernatural in until dawn. It was all actual reality. 
but like the, the, we- the Wendigo was like, but like actual reality is that that's like, true. It fe- was an actual on, monster. Like like cannibalism resulted yeah. in this horrible twisted creature kind of thing. That's true. That, but it wasn't like a ghost, you know. Right, right. So I'm interested to kind of see like what their twisted reality answer sure. is for this. Yeah. Um, right. But I, I will say the only character that I like is the captain, the chick. Yeah. She's yeah. the only one that I like. She's good. I've been... <laughs> so we, it reached a point where uh, the brother, I, just, I hated him so much. I had an opportunity... Sean or Sam Ashmore or whatever. Yeah, the, the dick brother. Yeah. So I hated him so much and I was just sick of his shit. Were you and, trying to get him killed? Oh, yeah. And I did. <laughs> That's and, great. But like the thing, that game... Gave me so many opportunities to save him. Well, oh, really? Yeah. I was going to say, it gives like you so many opportunities to try to kill, to him. kill him. I was. Well, it's always going to give you an opportunity to save the person. No, no. This is. This was. I. I put the controller down and I completely ignored six <laughs> quick time events in a row. Wow. And I thought, like, after two, he was going to die, but it was right. six in a row before it killed That's pretty him. Pretty good. So they really wanted him to survive. And I was like, no, he doesn't yeah, get I, to live. We'll we'll see. I, I don't, because in Until Dawn, I, maybe arbitrarily, I tried to save everyone every time. Even characters that I hated, I always tried to save them. And I fucked up at the end mm. and only saved Hayden Penetier's character, who's the only character that can't die. And yeah, that Emily, choice. the Asian chick, who's yeah, the huge with the bitch. light switch. Yes, yeah, that because I had saved. There were like four other characters that I had gotten all back there. That part and was I just fucked up. That one. That part choice. was badly. It was poorly designed because it was unclear about like where everybody was I and agree. like if they were going to be able to get clear and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I was bummed because the really hot blonde chick in Until Dawn she died early. And I was bummed about that because she was super hot. And then the black, the skinny black kid, he died relatively early on. I think because I think I made a mistake or I missed a QTE or something, and so he died. But everybody else was still alive. And then at the end, they all bit it. Yeah. And a lot of those characters I hated. But in this game, I'm not liking any of the characters except for yeah. the captain. And so I wonder. We'll see what happens as it goes. If I'm still gonna want to try to save everyone, if I can, or if like you, I'll use this as some like really narcissistic. Yes, let me play God and have <laughs> all these people I hate die. <laughs> um, I, another thing that I've like a difference between Until Dawn and this is that Until Dawn also has a lot of areas that are more open. Like, yeah. the, the, that game didn't shy away from, like, giving you the time to figure something out. This right. game is just railroading you the whole time. Like, they have a very specific cinematic experience with, like, camera angles and pacing that mm-hmm. they are going for. Um, that it just very much feels like I'm along for the ride and not really in control, except for at key moments. Um, whereas Until Dawn, I felt like I was actually playing the game. This sure. is very, very linear. Um I also think the actual controls are atrocious. Oh, man, it's so bad. Like, the movement. And it's just... Characters are just walking. Yep. And it is... It takes multiple tries to walk up to a thing at the right angle to be able to press X on it. Yeah. It's so bad. And it's like... I think it's because, you know, their pursuit for... Their pursuit of, like, really... Of realism and making things look really nice and like animation transitions, that there's like a delay on everything because there's mm. all this animation priority in like kind of like like a masturbatory way. Like they like <laughs> really really like their animations <laughs> for walking and movement, uh, and they really 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 want you to see all of them. Uh, and so like there's never a moment where there's a an animation that doesn't transition pretty well uh, in terms of the movement. And that just leads to, like, a lot of delay. Uh, and that can be frustrating, especially with all the fixed camera angles. Yes. Yeah, the fixed camera angles, it's very... It, plenty of other games have done it, but I always think of Devil May Cry and Resident Evil with those fixed, kind of canted, like, bad camera angles. For what you need to do in this space, the camera is not in a good place for you to do that thing. Yeah. It's cinematics over, like, utilization. Right. And that is really frustrating. Right. Um, Yeah, I mean, we're going to continue playing it every time I bring it up, and I'm like, hey, do you want to play more of that? And we're both kind of like, eh. We're going to, just because we want to see it through and see how it goes, but... 
it's not something we're super excited about continuing. Yeah, us neither. Um, it's only it was thirty bucks, right? I think that's right. Which yeah. felt like a lot. Really? Yes. I thought that felt really reasonable, especially we'll see after how long like, until Dawn was sixty. Yeah, but that's a that game is much bigger than this yeah. game is. So we'll see how long it is. And obviously, right. if it's bad, then definitely thirty dollars isn't going to feel like it was worth it. But, right? Uh, yeah. As far as the content, I was expecting it to be twenty, just because of the way they're treating this anthology. But we'll see if it ends up being you know a six to eight hour game. Thirty dollars, that's probably reasonable. Yeah, and and I'm sure like at the end of it, they'll have some sort of like a completed collection where you get all of them for right. a reduced price. So well, but it's over like the next three years they're releasing all of right. these. Right. So yeah, that's true. Be a while. Yeah, I wonder if be some cross of them will plat- or, uh, cross generation. Right. Yeah, I wonder <laughs> if some of them will be PlayStation Five. Well, cool. What else you got? Um, I bought and beat Control. Damn, you beat it. Yep. Did we talk about this last episode? It's no. been so long. I always forget. I have I, not. I, oh, I yet. really want to play that game. I've watched a bunch of gameplay videos and stuff of it. It looks so good. I was so hyped for it. It is tremendous. Oh, I'm so. Um, I need. I have to buy it. It's but I can't. Like, I have too much other stuff I'm already playing. Fuck. Yeah. It, the shooting, just it just feels so good. I mean, I was playing on PC, but I've heard that even console, like, the shooting feels really good. Just this mm-hmm. is the game I mentioned previously where apparently, even on a PS4 Pro, the performance is still pretty poor in a lot of oh, areas. Oh, man, really? Yeah. I don't know if that's something that they're patching or not. Let's hope. Um, but as of, like, day one patching... Uh, there was a lot of frame rate issues on the, even the PS4 Pro. I heard like the Xbox One X was really the only one that mitigated most of it, but even there, there were some performance issues. And I played uh, on medium settings on my PC. I have a 1060, um, and it only got framey once or twice in the whole game. Um, but other than that, I mean, it's just a gorgeous game. It looks phenomenal. Uh, just the like, art direction seems it's awesome, tremendous. I yeah. I cannot say enough good things about Control. It just, like, man. There are, like, some areas that are just straight out of an M.C. Escher painting. And, like, mm. they're shifting and they're moving. Yeah. Just the way everything shifts and moves. The way everything breaks apart and looks. Because you have these powers, basically. And I guess, okay, for those of you who don't know the setup of the game, um, you play as a woman who has showed up to this building called the Oldest House. Uh, and in the oldest house, there is a Federal Bureau of Control that is set up. And they're, think like X Files, kind of, mm-hmm. but like maybe less, um, less like aliens and more like other planes and like weird ghost supernatural yeah, stuff. Yeah, very psychological stuff. Yes. Um, uh, and this is by the same studio who made Alan Wake, which, funny enough, I actually found, is towards the end of the game, I found a couple notes, and this has been floating around the internet, so I don't mind saying it, but I found a couple of notes that mentioned um, Bright Falls, where Alan Wake mm. actually takes place, and mention mm. the ev- event, altered world event, that occurred in Bright Falls, and okay. so like, they happen so in the same, same universe, universe, which is yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, and it make, makes me think it, it's cool because they found a really neat way to provide greater context for the events of a game that has already been out and that I have an affinity for, right. um, which is really neat. But, uh, yeah, it's man, that game is good. Uh, so you basically you have uh, all right, the opening moments of the game. You show up to this oldest house and it's clear you have an agenda and in a very uh <laughs> deadly premonition kind of way you're speaking to this entity inside of your head um Hmm. and like kind of like referring to them like without saying their name and other stuff like that um where in deadly premonition he's talking to like his dead brother zach or something or no is it zach or is he zach no his dead brother zach and then also it also reminded me of um oh god what was what was that game with ellen page in Yep. And Defoe. That, the Quantum Break game? Or Quantum... Uh, quantum Quantic Dream game? Yeah, Quantic Dream game. Uh, Beyond Two Souls. Beyond Two Souls, thank you. Yeah. Um, in a very... Also a very Beyond Two Souls way, this thing seems to be able to kind of guide you to places and do some certain gotcha. things. Uh, a little less like it has powers um, than it kind of helps you attain your own powers. 
Uh, and it, it clearly like led you here. And so you show up and you're walking around and the building, it's kind of like emptied out. And you, the only person you're really coming in contact with is this janitor. And this janitor's fucking off the walls, man. <laughs> like his accent is from nowhere. It's like a conglomeration of a bunch of different accents. And he uses these phrases and these words incorrectly in like weird ways. He's just a fascinating character. Um, and they do a lot with him, which is really fun. Uh, and then you show up to the director's office, uh, and you kind of, you assume the role of the director. There are some events that happen and you assume the role of the director and you get the director's gun, which is like Mm -hmm. this special, it's an object of power. Like there are objects of power. Um, and then using the, with the help of your entity that is with you, you like bond with the weapon of power and get its, its power. So then you have the power to like telekinesis like throw stuff around and do other yeah. stuff and then it's also a gun and it can change forms and shapes and so there's also like some light rpg elements where you're getting these like mods and stuff that you can slot in to like your character for like increased reload speed movement speed better health all this other stuff and you're getting like better versions of those mods throughout the game you can also mod your weapons for like more accuracy more damage and like more specific stuff that have to do with the different types of the different forms the gun can take it's fascinating uh and it almost has like a dark souls thing where there are these fast travel points, these control points, and you go back to those control points in order to upgrade your stuff and, like, spend all your points. Uh, okay. Um, uh, you can equip your things on the fly, but you can't, like, upgrade or spend points and, and do all these other things. Uh, there's also a system called uh, Board something. I forget the name that they refer to it as. But it's basically, like, automatically generated busy work quests that you can complete while doing your main your main quests mm-hmm. uh and they just give you like extra stuff like extra mods and like currency to upgrade and stuff like that and are those just like kill x amount of guys like, yeah they can those? be like kill certain types of enemies kill them in okay. certain ways kill enemies in certain areas stuff like that um yeah just a really strange very strange game but like the the standout thing is the environments the enemy design the encounter sure. design is phenomenal um and they just, like, the toy box that they give you with which to, like, wreck this place is <laughs> really, really good. And it just looks I, tremendous. The, the perf- performances of the characters are fantastic. I would say, like, this game rivals, um, like, Until Dawn facial capture tech. Hmm. Uh, it game looks re- really, really good. Um, I, I read that man. it has, like, Metroidvania elements of, like... Yeah. You unlock certain stuff that you have to, like, you know, go back to get into new areas, right. et cetera. And the thing that I was worried about is that I read before, like, oh, the the, the oldest house changes and it shifts and things yeah. change or whatever. But it's less – it doesn't do that in a way that makes getting around confusing. Like, the okay. core travel routes never change. Uh, and there's always the fast travel as well. Um, but your core travel routes don't change. It's like opening up new areas is kind of how the house changes. Yeah. Um, I was worried that it was going to, like, shift around and, like, now this area is over here and stuff. like. But they don't do any of that, which is good because the game is hard enough to get around in as it is because the map is really bad. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's a flat 2D map, and some of the mm-hmm. areas are very like an Escher painting. Mm-hmm. Crazy and very... Um, labyrinthian um but i i think it's it uh, oh yeah and all of the like the notes and like the recordings and there's like a little tv show that they have that is really fucked um (laughs) and you can watch and listen and read all that stuff back in your menu if you want as you encounter it but like i found myself in a way because i have i have like collect collectible fatigue especially in open world games like i don't just like collecting stuff for the sake of collecting it like i don't care i don't engage in that anymore but this i was searching every area to find every note i could so i could read it because they're just fascinating just like fillers in the edge of these worlds sure and then like a couple of them give you hints about where to like find better mods and stuff uh like hidden caches of stuff or like one of them gives you a clue about how to navigate this area properly um, and in a way that almost feels like maybe it should have 
just been in like the quest description. <laughs> but uh, I guess that's the point is like the game doesn't shy away from throwing things at you that are optional. Uh, yeah. And then like if you don't figure it out and you can't complete it, shrug. Sure. Like that's on you, uh, which is kind of kind of refreshing. It's not holding your hand in that respect. Um, yeah, I just the design of that game blows me away. It it's, sounds awesome. It's the best game that I have played so far this year. Okay, that was going to be my next question, if it's in that, that game of the year conversation. And the answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that might be my number one so far. Mm. It might be. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to play it. Blew me away. Um, and I like I could not get enough of it. And I, I would say that uh, the ending really confused me. And I had to kind of sit and think about it for a while and like kind of mm-hmm. think through what I knew, what I had discovered of how things work. And then I feel like I've kind of puzzled it together a bit. Um, but yeah, it uh, the game really made you think. <laughs> and like then, <laughs> like there are notes and stuff that are just really, really funny, like little anecdotes. Like there, there's an area called, I think it's the Letters, um, which is where they... They, they built this whole branch of the oldest house to encompass all of these strange letters. Like, any letters that people sent that... they are transcriptions of them that uh, could point towards any kind of weird paranormal activity. And so mm. you're finding a lot of these notes and stuff in those areas. And there's one about a plane that's very funny. And it's just, just a lot of strange, weird anecdotes that kind of like stick with you and like i said kind of fill in the edges of that universe in a fun way um yeah and like there there are like like notes you'll find in one area and then you'll find like a reference to that note like on a whiteboard somewhere else in the oldest house and it's like okay you don't have to pick up on that stuff yeah. you might never see that but when you do it's like oh yeah you feel totally. so smart because you pay it attention just fills that out yeah yeah uh and it, it makes it feel like a place where even though people aren't really there anymore, it makes it feel like a place where people really lived. And they thought a mm-hmm. lot about like the bureaucracy of how an organization like that would deal with the, these concepts. It's so smart. It's so mm-hmm. smart. Sweet. Very good game. Well, I know you've also been playing Gears 5. Yeah. But I'll uh, mention just really quick. I played a little bit more Metro Exodus. I did get to where it sort of opens up a lot more in this big water area. And I've done the what I think is the first half of the water area where you go to this like little floating village that seems very religiously whatever. Um, and it was weird because it's kind of like this little self-contained mini story about this like, you know, little cult with a mother and her daughter who want to leave and you help rescue them. But it like all happens in like a half hour and then yeah. like you just move on. And so that was like, I don't know, a little bit weird because it felt like they could have blown that out into something a lot bigger and more interesting. But being more in a big open space, I'm definitely enjoying the game more than when I was kind of like railroaded through corridors, railroaded pun um, and on the train and that kind of thing. Right. But uh, the actual being, navigating in the water is not my favorite no. and like having to hop out to like explore etc but i'm feeling much better about the future of the game knowing that it's more open the way that it currently is so yeah and every I'll continue to chip very away different at that. yeah uh and then i played a little bit of destiny 2 haven't gone back to it in probably two weeks since this other stuff's been coming out but i finally did some stuff in the dreaming city which is like the post game area uh, it's a really, really cool area. It's such a bummer that like, we totally fell off the game before we fully explored it because the place like in Forsaken, that main area that you are in, in Forsaken, is so boring like throughout the whole story right. and stuff. But the Dreaming City is really, really cool looking. Uh, it has all this... It's a, it's very Taken influenced, so it has a lot of the like alternate dimension, black reality, a bunch of like gems uh, and stuff everywhere. It just looks really cool, and there's a lot of hidden secrets there. Um, I am not spending the time or energy to like fully dive into exploring this area and getting all the nooks and crannies and hidden shit, but it it is nice. It feels like Leviathan 
it, when that DLC came out where it was this big ship where there was all this hidden stuff that was so cool to discover and find. It feels like they've they've replicated that, which is sweet. Okay. It's just a bummer that it's only the post game area. Right. And not the actual full story game area. Um so yeah, I, I you know, Shadow Keep comes out October first. As of now I have no intention of purchasing that. So I think I probably was just like wasting time with Destiny 2 the past several weeks. <laughs> um, but who knows, man? Like that game always finds a way to pull me back in yeah. for small bursts of time because uh, the gameplay is just so good and the world and the universe is so has so much potential. So who knows? Maybe, probably not next episode because Borderlands 3 is taking up will be taking up all of the very small gaming time I have. But at some point, don't be surprised to hear Destiny 2 come up again on the, on the podcast. <laughs> so tell me about Gears 5. Uh, I beat Gears 5. Jeez, man. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I, was I hate sick. you so much. I was much. sick for three days, man. So was I, but I didn't play jack shit. Yeah. It was funny. Uh, uh, our buddy Aaron, listener to the podcast, who wrote an email as well that we'll get to. He uh, When I made the announcement on Facebook, hey, sorry, no podcast last weekend, he's like, oh, yeah, if you're sorry you're sick, but if you have time, check out Astral Chain, new game on Switch from Platinum Games. And I wanted to reply and be like, Aaron, you clearly don't know what it's like to have a sick child. <laughs> Me being home and being sick doesn't mean that I have like free time. It just means I'm miserable <laughs> while also still being a dad. <laughs> um All right. So I beat Gears 5 in 2 days. <laughs> um It's It's good. Mhm. In a way that, like, okay, so with Borderlands, Borderlands is great because it's more Borderlands, but there's a lot of quality of life improvements, right? and, like, they made a lot of smart changes that people who are fans and have been playing the games for a long time will appreciate. Gears 5 is just more Gears, um, with okay. one new kind of addition to its dramatic detriment um and that is open areas like large open areas gears has always been like a, a railroad like a wild thrill ride through the game where things ramp up and get crazy and it's just shoot 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 run and cover roto run over here shoot 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 uh marcus yells about some shit and like chainsaws uh, a locust in half and then he runs and shoots some more this is that for like the opening hour of the game and then it and then you get to this area maybe two hours and you get to this area that is completely open it's a snowy area and you're driving around on this skiff which is really cool because it's got like this paraglider thing and that's how it's being pulled across the ice and snow and that's really cool but the only reason there's a big open area is is so that you drive around these giant open empty spaces where nothing happens <laughs> and then on the edges of them are where you can stop off and you can't drive your skiff in there because there's barricades so you have mm -hmm. to get off the skiff walk into the new area and then you go and do a story thing or go into <laughs> a side area where you can get upgrades for the robot that travels with you jack or like different abilities cuz you you're also getting like abilities and stuff that jack is capable of using so you can upgrade his abilities too which like that's a smart fun new thing that like keeps the game changing and makes you feel a little bit of ownership over over stuff but it's like i spent so much time like there's maybe an extra tw maybe an extra 25 percent of game time just spent because i had to fly this or drive this skiff from point to point Okay. It was just way too much. And it Does was anything boring. happen while you're doing that? No. Like, sometimes the it, characters talk. Because it makes me think of God of War when you're on the right. Lake of Nines, where that part, like, despite the fact that you're just rowing from one thing to the next, there's a lot of great storytelling that's happening during right. Those There's times. really good storytelling, and there's a lot of hidden stuff around. Yes. So you're always yes. looking for stuff. Right. This, there's just nothing. Like, mm. there's, like, in each, there are either two or three really big open areas that you do this in and in each of those there's maybe like one or two things that are in the middle of the areas that are hidden that don't have like 
interest points on them that you could find extra upgrade parts, and that's it. Uh, one time, I got out of my skiff at a rock, and some hmm. robots came out of the ground, and I shot them. And then I got back okay. in the skiff and left. Uh, that's something that happened, I guess. But it's just, like, it's so boring, and it's a waste of time. It's like they they played God of War, and they were like, well, the abbreviation for God of War is the same as Gears of War. Maybe we should, like, <laughs> do some of that. But just they had, not as well. Yeah, they had no idea how to do it properly, or, like, the, yeah. the work that goes into the depth of it. Because also, the thing with... Uh, God of War is that area is also changing throughout the story and evolving, totally. so you also get to see it change and evolve in cool and interesting ways. This doesn't that even game's have that. fucking good. I know you didn't like it yeah, that much. I God of War of was fucking it. good. There Just all, talking about it makes me like, oh man, that game was awesome. There are a lot of really smart design ideas, and then they stuck you with a kid. Um, <laughs> but like, I don't know. I, I have a lot of conflicting feelings on Gears 5 because the shooting well, still feels great. Okay. A lot of the sure. encounter designs are still really strong. There's some mm -hmm. new enemies, some returning enemies. They throw them at you in different kinds of configurations. There's some new guns um, that are really cool. And, like, the, the environments you go to vary widely and are well-designed. But then you have to hop back on that GD skiff and drive around for a bunch of time. It's Are you boring. invested in the story and, like, the characters? Yeah, so that, they at least do some interesting stuff there. And there's some payoff to, like, the mysteries that's been going on about, like, this chick's medallion. Kind of how they left off with the last game. Okay. Uh, you get some payoff for that. Um, and then the game, towards the end, the game makes you make a binary choice between two things. And that was the fucking dumbest thing possible because all right i'll just i'll just say it the game makes you choose between two people one has to live and one has to die mm -hmm. and i will say the game did a piss poor job of making you feel bad or like the because this one of the characters is supposed to have a redemption arc and it just never really gets there and mm. like they don't have enough time, so like of course I'm gonna choose the person who's with me okay. the whole fucking game. Why would yeah. I choose the other guy? Like, all right, there's a reason why I would choose the other guy, but I'm not gonna say it. Not a good enough reason, right? Because this other guy is just a worse version of my favorite guy. So <laughs> why would I care if he lived? Right. Anyways, I don't know that that. More than the skiff, that angered me because it was just so lazy and poorly done. And it was like, so you have a knife and you can throw it to free one person or the other from this creature. Or in my head, you could just fucking throw the knife at the creature <laughs> instead of one of the arms that's holding him. Just yeah. throw it at the creature's face. Yeah, but would that kill it? It might let it. It just... might let both of them go because it's like ah, knife in my face. I would let go of stuff if I had a knife in my face. See, that would be cool if there was a tertiary option that where you could know. throw it at the monster. I tried, but then you don't know, and then like oh, actually, if you throw it at the monster, the monster kills both those characters. I'd be okay with that too. <laughs> I didn't care that much about either of them. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> sound like you were that invested in the story. <laughs> But I was invested in the main character Kate, story. Yeah, Kate's story. I was invested in that, and there's some payoff there, which is good. But, like, I, I, if they had done nothing, I would have been totally fine, and it would have I would have not had to remark about it at all. But then they, like, they make you choose between these two characters that you don't have an affinity for, mm -hmm. and you're like, it's fucking stupid. <laughs> I don't know. Whatever. Gears 5. It's a video game. I played it and I beat it, and now I don't ever have to play it again. It sounds like it is perfectly fine. Yes. Yeah. It is a straight average. Uh, well, let's switch things up just a little bit, and let's talk about movies before TV, because we both watched not new movies. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, our internet went out. For, it was out for like two days uh, this past week because there were AT&T guys here digging in our front yard to install a new line for our neighbors. 
and they cut our Comcast line. So while they were installing internet for our neighbors, they broke my internet, which is pretty fucking frustrating. Yeah. Uh, so we didn't have internet for two days. So basically we were Amish. Um, <laughs> and so I watched The Hangover. Because I was just going through our DVD Blu-ray pile like, what do we have that I want to watch here? It was like, I think it was a Friday afternoon, like right after work or something. Or Thursday, maybe. But, uh, yeah, that movie is good. I've actually been watching a lot of um, Between Two Ferns, which I didn't add to the news, but they're making a Between Two Ferns movie on Netflix. A movie? Yes, it looks really weird. You should yeah. watch the trailer. Okay. Uh, and so seeing that, I was like, oh, this means I should go watch all of Between Two Ferns, I guess, with Zach Galifianakis. So they're I was super doing good. That. They are. They're very, very, very good. The Obama one is my favorite. <laughs> the, I like the one with Jerry Seinfeld because Jerry's such an asshole to him. Yeah. I mean, they're all assholes to him. But uh, the one with Jerry Seinfeld was great because he's like, so Zach, do you think that if you guys hadn't cashed in on the hangover and done the, you know, lazy quick money grab of part two and part three, (laughs) do you think that the first hangover would have gone down in history as a comedy classic? And Zach just kind of like glares. (laughs) And I was like, "Mm, I should go back and watch the hangover just for funsies. So I watched it. I would not consider it a comedy classic. It it's good. It's very funny, but it's not that great. It was of it. It was a very momentary thing. That's true. I mean, like, uh, Ed Helms is fantastic. Zach Galifianakis is fantastic. It's a funny movie, but it's not. I. It is nowhere near what I would consider a comedy classic. But when it's a Thursday after work and you don't have internet, it's a fine thing to watch. Yeah. Why not? And then on Friday, uh, because we didn't have internet, obviously, I was gonna go play my Switch because I could play it offline. I have some games installed. But the battery's dead, because every time I want to play my Switch, which only happens like every two weeks, the battery has drained, and so I never can play it. It's really frustrating. So instead, my wife and I watched Matilda, because <laughs> I let her pick a movie that she wanted to watch. And thankfully, she picked Matilda over, like, How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days, because Ooh. then I would not have watched it with her. But Matilda, that movie is a classic. Yeah. That movie is absolutely fantastic. Just the fantasy uh like fairy tale nature of the story is just so charming and and great i love that movie yeah it's fun to have that kind of a story in like a more mundane setting yeah totally um i watched get smart with is that steve carell (laughs) yeah with steve carell okay i'm trying to remember which one that was steve carell and anne hathaway yeah yeah um i actually watched that while i was playing remnant from the ashes okay um. Wait, have I talked? I talked about that, right? No. Last episode. Yes, yes, you did. Talk okay, about it last I thought episode. I did. Yeah, because it's very yeah. Dark Souls. Yeah. Um. Well, wait. Did I talk about Get Smart then? Last episode. No. What year is it? <laughs> it's been three weeks. Look, I'm very busy. I've. Well, I hadn't started picture, classes yet last episode. The bigger thing is Get Smart came out like six years ago. We don't need to go into a huge conversation about Get Smart. Right. Yeah, I didn't talk about it. It's um, And I was also only half watching it because I was also playing a game. But every time I looked over, Steve Carell was doing his thing. <laughs> Had you seen it before? Yeah. Okay. It's fun. Didn't they make a second one with... Uh... Rebel Wilson in it? Oh, I don't know. Anne Hathaway is hot, though. I disagree. Anne Hathaway is a good-looking lady. Maybe it's just because I cannot stand her. I do not think she's a good actress. And people are, like, obsessed with her. I mean, I also don't... I don't think she's bad. She's just hot. I don't see a a sequel on here anywhere. Maybe Maybe that was in my mind. But maybe, get smart. Like maybe you just a, wish a there was a sequel because Anne Hathaway is hot, and you won't admit it. Incorrect. Um. But yeah, that's the only movie that I watched. I've been watching a few shows though. Yeah. Well, let's talk about eight Marvel's Agents of Shield because we both watched that. Yeah. It just came. Season six just came to Netflix. I was really, really disappointed to see that it was only thirteen episodes instead of like the normal twenty to twenty-two. That was a bummer because I love that show. And season seven is going to be the final season. I'll be very sad when it's gone. I finished it. 
You are about halfway through it, sounds like. I am... I feel like I'm on episode nine. Oh, okay. That's like two-thirds through then. Yeah. Um, it... They do weird stuff in this season. It yeah. feels... It reminds me a lot of the first couple of seasons with the dude who was uh, a, a Hydra sleeper agent. What was his name? Oh. The handsome guy. That I really yeah, liked. The, who was also in Until Dawn. Right. Um, um, oh, apparently I'm on episode 11 now. I finished oh, episode geez. 10. So yeah, I'm man, almost you're done. almost done. Finish that shit. Uh, what the hell is this guy's name? Where is he? Brett Dalton. Grant Ward. I was going to say West, Ward, but it's yes. Ward. Ward. So in the first season when it comes out that he's a Hydra sleeper agent, but whatever, they kill him. But then they keep finding ways to keep the actor on the show. We're like, yeah. oh, he's actually possessed. And then he was Hive, which is some like alien thing. I I don't know. I, I actually want to rewatch the whole show because it's yeah. really. And good, then but... he was in the framework. Right, that's true. I forgot they brought him back for that too. So at the end of last season, Coulson, you find out that Coulson is going to die because he's, you know, has this alien disease from the events of last season. And so then he dies, and he's kind of off the show. But they don't want to. They don't want Clark Gregg to be off the show, so they find a way to have him play a different character who is like, is he also Agent Coulson? Is he the same person? And he isn't, but like, he kind of is, but he definitely isn't. And so it's, that feels a little lame. Yeah. Because it's not the character. Uh, And with the Ward stuff, it didn't feel as lame because he was a villain. And so it was a little bit more okay for them to like keep tapping into that well. But with Coulson, they're just replacing the main character of the show with a different character played by the same actor. It's yeah, just weird. I would also say that the guy who played Grant Ward is capable of greater emotional range than I the would guy agree. who plays I Coulson. don't want to shit on Clark Gregg. I love Clark Gregg. It, his agent Coulson is... Everyone fucking loves that character, which is why they made this show. It's because yeah. people loved that character so much and they killed him off in the first Avengers movie. That's why they made this show. <laughs> He's great, but I totally agree with you. Brent Dalton is a better actor than Clark Gregg is. Yeah, I just... I don't think that bringing him back in this capacity has really done him any service. <laughs> I would agree with that. I will say, and we can maybe talk about it next episode after you've finished it, there's a thing that happens at the end of the... like the very end of the season, and the little stinger for the next season. You're going to roll your eyes. And so then uh-huh. we can talk about it when that happens. Because uh, obviously this, and I was surprised because typically shows go on Netflix like months and months after they air, but this show just aired. Like the finale, I think aired in early August. So oh. I'm very hopeful that they'll do the same thing with season seven and put it on Netflix right after it airs, because then it's at least somewhat relevant. Well, do you um, think it's going to be on Disney's thing now? No. No? No. I think they'll put it on Netflix. Okay. Okay. But even if they put on Disney Plus, it's not going to matter because I'm buying that shit anyway. Yay, another streaming service I'm going to pay for. I'm not. Uh, But yeah, while it was a bummer, it was 13 episodes. I will say it seems like they were able to condense the budget more because a lot of the. I feel like it had more visual effects and like more CG stuff that all looked really high quality. So maybe. Like the show has been on a downward trend the last couple of seasons, and it's always been a little bit in limbo, like are they going to renew it or not? So I'm sure the budget's kind of gone down, but only doing 13 episodes, I'm sure, lets them like consolidate that cash spend. Because in previous seasons, a lot of the act... Not the effects, because the fire effects and like guns and stuff always looked good, but like the CG space shit always looked like a TV show. It looked a little right. bit lame. And this, I thought, was a lot more successful. Uh, There's a lot of really fun storylines. Like, when they're on that casino planet and... um, And they eat those puffs. Yeah, Daisy and and Simmons (laughs) get super high. They get super baked on those, like, (laughs) alien puffs. That was just... Like, a lot of really fun stuff. It does... The show's always done this. It always has this, like, sarcastic, jokey sense of humor to it while they are also trying to save the world from complete annihilation. So there's always a little bit of, like, those things kind of butt heads. Right. It definitely feels like that this time around, too. Uh, probably more so, or maybe just diminishing returns. Um, I'll also say that with Mac, 
Henry Simmons, the huge fucking black dude, who's like the biggest dude I have ever seen. He's like huge. he is the he is the most Jack dude I have ever seen in my life. He's the new director replacing Coulson, and that character I have never loved because Same. he's all, he's pretty uptight and like I like him because he's an open Christian, which you do not see very often on TV nowadays because people hate Christians for whatever reason. Well, I know why, but. It's because of the vocal minority. Anyway, I like that he is an open Christian and he's a good person. But I feel like that character trait also leads him to be really close-minded about stuff, which is annoying. Right. Um, So him kind of leading the storylines, I'm not enjoying as much as when we had Agent Coulson. But yeah, overall, it's just uh, that, that show, that show is Smallville, but much better. You know what I mean? Like it's it's yeah, that yeah. like nostalgic <laughs> fanboy Marvel loviness that I like it gives me the warm feelies, but the quality is much higher than Smallville. It's not an amazing show, but it's good at least. Yeah. And Smallville is it's, not. Good. It's better than a lot of bad shows that I've watched. Yeah. Totally. I've watched a lot of bad shows and still enjoyed them. Yes. This at least I feel like I don't have to it isn't be bad. embarrassed for liking it. Yeah, it isn't <laughs> bad. It's not like it's not amazing. It's not a Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones. Like it's not like that kind of great drama, but it isn't bad at least. Uh, what is bad is Smallville. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so I'm in. I'm in season five. Um, I think I'm like halfway through season five, maybe. Just want to comment on two episodes. So last podcast, I mentioned a couple of bad episodes from season five with the vampire sororities and shit, which is just absolutely ridiculous. There's an episode in this season called Lexmas, which is their Christmas episode. And it uh, Lex goes into a coma like everyone does on CW shows. And because this is basically a soap opera with Superman in it. And uh, it, he sees a vision of his future should it's like a ghost of christmas past sort of thing where it's like hey if you make this choice this will be your future where he gets married to lana and they have a little kid he gives up all of his money and now he's like living in the suburbs and so it's this balance of because he's running for state senate he wants to be the president obviously he's obsessed with power and money and wealth and all that stuff and it's like hey if you give that up look how happy you'll be you'll win the woman of your dreams and you'll be so content and blah 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 And he's like, yeah, yeah, I will. And then at the end, he's like, actually, no, fuck you. I want the power. (laughs) And just like totally on a dime just changes his mind anyway, uh, which is pretty fucking stupid. Uh, It just the episode was so corny and lame anyway. And then a couple episodes later, there's an episode where uh, it opens with Clark proposing to Lana, coming clean, telling her his secret taking her to uh, the Fortress of Solitude, telling her that she, he has all these powers, blah, 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 saying this is why Lex is always looking after me, you have to keep my secret, etc. Clark's dad, who decides to run for state senate and for some reason is able to win, even though he's like a bumpkin from Smallville fucking Kansas. It's the most dumbass thing ever. And Lois becomes his campaign manager, <laughs> even though she has no <laughs> skills or experience doing that. It's the most just stupid ass shit. Like, everyone is amazing at everything on these types of shows. Like, any random person, like, oh, I'm a cop and a campaign manager and... While being in college, and I can do kung fu, and I used to be a lieutenant in the military. Like, everyone can do everything. And I'm handsome. (laughs) That too. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, so Clark's dad wins the election, who's running against Lex. And then Lana goes and visits Lex. Lex is honest because he's wasted. Because he's getting drunk because he's all bummed. He it comes clean that he's in love with her. And she's like, Bob, I'm getting I'm getting married to Clark. Fuck you. And so he somehow figures out that she knows what his secret is. And then he's chasing her on the road. So she's driving and he's driving. And it's nighttime and it's rainy. And she gets fucking run over by a bus and dies. And so Clark's like, What? So he goes to Jor-El, his dad, in the Fortress of Solitude. He's like, Dad, you have to let me change this. There has to be a way. She can't die. And there's a big thing at the end of last season where Clark saved his dad's life. And he was like, um, Jor-El was like, some life has to be exchanged for this life. At some point, someone you love is going to fucking die. And Clark's like, fine, whatever. We'll deal with that when it happens. Ends up being Lana. 
And Clark's like, no, there has to be another way. And jor like, okay, this one time, I'll let you rewind time to save her. Something is this, else is going to happen. Is this what? when he flies around the Earth so fast that it goes back in time? No, he doesn't. That is an actual Superman power right. that happens in the comics. I didn't, they don't, I didn't know if they did that in Smallville. They make a joke about it. The, oh, one okay. of the good things about this show is they make a lot of joke references to stuff that happens in the comics. So they make a joke about that because... Uh, uh, Chloe, Clark's best friend, knows about his secret, and so when Clark go- does go back in time, he is he's telling Chloe like, "Hey, I have lived this already. We're back in time." He he does stuff to convince her that it's true, and she's like, "What'd you do? Run around the Earth to rewind time?" Like, which is a, okay. it, it's very on the nose jokes, but I still appreciate it as a comic book nerd. So instead. Instead of Clark telling Lana his secret, because that's what leads her to go to Lex, and Lex finds out that she knows the secret and chases her down and she dies, Clark instead doesn't tell Lana the secret, so then she gets fed up with his lying and breaks up with him. And so that's the whole thing of, like, Clark having to give up his love to save her life. It's a really powerful moment. And then they completely undo it because Clark's dad still wins the election. Lana goes over to Lex because he's still drunk and asking for, hey, I'm drunk, come talk to me. Lex tells her that he's in love with her, kisses her. She kind of rejects it, but like kind of not because we're broken up and maybe I do have feelings for Lex. And Lex's whole thing is like, Lana, I can't blame you for breaking up with Clark because all he does is lie to you. And Lana's like, yeah, I can't be with someone that lies to me. Literally in the previous episode, Lex lied to her about everything because this Kryptonian ship landed on Earth during another meteor shower Lana saw alien, Kryptonian aliens come out, kill a bunch of people, and leave. No one believes her that it happened except Lex because Lex found the fucking ship and was doing research on it. Would not tell her that he found the ship. And he was like, I don't know, Lana. I think you should give up on this. Finally was honest and was like, okay, yeah, I have the ship. Let's look into it together. And then Zod who is masquerading as Clark's teacher, who I mentioned last episode, he steals the ship and leaves, and he's kind of, like, gone from the show right now. So the ship is gone. Meanwhile, Lex and Lana are, like, doing research on the ship. Meanwhile, he's not telling her that the ship is gone. So then he's like, hey, yeah, by the way, the thing that everyone's looking for and hunting us for for the ship, it's gone. She's like, how could you lie to me? This whole time you've you've been telling me that we're looking at the ship and you're lying to me. And then in the next episode, Lex is like, Yo, girl, you got to be with someone who's honest with you. I would never lie to someone I love. And she's like, you're right, Lex. Clark lies to me. You wouldn't lie to me. And I'm like yelling at the TV. Like literally like in the period of the show, this is like two days ago where you were yelling at him and and saying that you're never going to trust him again because he lied to you. It's just the show is garbage. It's so terrible. (laughs) And that's why I have really like slowed down on it. I'm watching an episode or two a week because... I it's hard to get through because it's so bad. The writing is so bad. And then Clark's dad dies. So that's the exchange. He wins the election, but then he has like a heart attack and he fucking dies. And so he's dead. And so Clark tells his mom and he's honest. He's like, hey, I rewound time to save Lana and now dad's dead. This is my fault. And his mom's like, no, you didn't know. Like, you couldn't have known this was going to happen. If you had to choose between saving your dad or saving Lana, you wouldn't be able to make that choice. This isn't your fault. And I'm like, yes, it is. He rewound time to save her and instead his dad dies. It is his fault that his dad is dead. He made the choice that made his dad die. Let's not pretend like he's a hero here. So, that, yeah. <laughs> you know, all he had to really do is tell Lana not to drive on that road that night. That would have been too easy. go with her. Well, they actually did explain their way out of that, which I agreed with, because Chloe brought that same thing up. He's like, hey, just don't let Lana leave the party to go see Lex. And Clark's thing is like, yes, but now that she knows my secret, there will always be people that are trying to find out about what I can do. And so she will always and forever now be in danger because of that fact. And so it was about saving her from that knowledge and being in danger. If I was Chloe, I would have been like, yo, well, then why did you put me in danger by telling me you're seeing Yeah, it? right? But, yeah. Um, it's a bad show. It yep. ain't Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., that's for sure. <laughs> right. Uh, and then just really quick, still watching Sherlock in The Office and The League. We're now in season six of The Office, which is when, like, Saber just acquired them. So it ain't funny anymore, 
but we're still watching it occasionally. The league we're in season five, uh, we're racing because it's only 13 episode seasons. And I wanted, now that football's back, I wanted to start it up because it's about football and fantasy football. So that's been, that's a nice background show. Uh, and then still watching Hyperdrive. I think we have a couple episodes left of that. Um, it's still good. It's so heavily reliant on, I don't know if I've mentioned this, but because it's, you know, a race car drifting um, obstacle course show. Right. And one of the obstacles is a bridge that in the first round you needed to drive, like the bridge is at a 45 degree angle. Uh, you need to drive up and land as far close to the edge as you can. And then they release the weights. And so it kind of tips down. And depending on how far to the edge you were willing to drive, it makes the bridge go down faster, which gives you an advantage. And that was in the first round. Now they have changed it to where you drive up the bridge, but instead of it going all the way down, like going from 45 degree angle one way to 45 degree angle the other way and driving off, you need to get it to balance at a perfect straight line. So you have to like move forward and back and like the weight of the car is making the bridge kind of seesaw. Right. And that obstacle one has nothing to do with driving skill. So that's, it's stupid because it's just about like weight management. It's not about driving. And two, you get like two minutes. Cause like the obstacle course takes like five, six, seven, eight minutes, depending on which obstacles they choose. And it takes like the it gives you like two minutes on this conveyor or the the seesaw bridge thing. If you fail, that's two minutes that you have wasted. Plus, they give you like a sixty second penalty. So like, someone can be driving on the obstacle course portion, fuck up every single obstacle. But if they're able to get the seesaw bridge in like a minute and a half, they're going to be in like the top three, compared to someone who can ace every single obstacle and then fail on the bridge thing, they're going to be in the bottom half of the scores. That's pretty dumb. So only like this one obstacle, which is the least skillful obstacle of all of them decides your placement. And so there have been a couple people who have ended up getting cut because drivers who are clearly worse than them succeed on the bridge when they don't. And so that's been very, very frustrating. I sent a tweet to the hyperdrive account and said, Hey, if you guys do a season two of this, Get the fuck rid of this. I think it's called Leverage is the name of the obstacle because it's stupid. So that's a little bit frustrating, but it's still fun. Yeah, it's about cars. Uh, and then So You Think You Can Dance. We're down to the top four. I think the finale is out. We just haven't watched it yet. They cut the right two people, thankfully. The top four are the four that should be in the top four, which I am grateful for that. It is very clear to me who's going to get first, second, third, and fourth. We'll see if it plays out that way. But hey, dancing. And then finally, yesterday on Saturday, I had my daughter all day and we were playing some Borderlands. I wasn't in the mood to watch Harry Potter, so instead I watched a bunch of stand-up. I watched some Jim Gaffigan, uh, the new Chappelle stand-up, and his older Netflix Chappelle stand-up. Watched a thing of Tom Segura. So, uh, comedy. Yeah, Kara and I watched a Tom Segura. He's good. He's not amazing, but he's good. I like him. He does that, like, dark comedy, very, like... Ooh, neck, you know, like, ooh, is that okay to say kind of stuff? Ricky Gervais right. kind of attitude. But he's good. Um, I guess lastly, I watched Tiny House Nation on Netflix. <laughs> uh, so that show, the, the thing that kind of annoys me about that show is, like, there are two guys that go around. The conceit is they, they, they're the guys who come in last minute to these projects and help them finish uh, on okay. time. So like things are not progressing or they have a really tight schedule they need extra hands so these guys come in and they finish it for them yeah um and kind of like help them transition into tiny home living the the one guy the older guy i think he says things and starts conversations to create drama for the show which is frustrating and i don't like but the other guy He's mostly there. Like, he's just a really nice dude with a good attitude. And he comes up with all these crazy, awesome solutions. And he's the one who, like, puts these last minute projects together Mm -hmm. um, and is, like, really fun and has these crazy designs. Like, for one of them, he's like, I really want these guys to have, like, a back deck because, like, it's really important, you know, that they, like, have this extra space that they can go around. But we don't really have time to build, like, a hydraulic system, and that can be really heavy and really pricey. Uh, so what if we had, you know, some sort of, like, a self-standing deck where you put the two, like, you, uh, <laughs> you like, um, stake 
these two things down in the ground and then you just drive the camper forward the house forward like five feet and the thing just stands itself up off the back of the thing Mm -hmm. on the pegged legs it's like Mm -hmm. that's such a cool (laughs) fucking idea yeah like that what a smart solution this guy's very smart (laughs) and like there are elements of his personality that remind me of one of my friends who is a set designer and a master carpenter and so the connection in my brain is just also Mm. like he's doing a lot of the same kind of stuff that my friend does and so it's just a it was a fun little show and there's only one season of it on there right now but there are a lot of really neat tiny homes and i never really thought about because they have like pop-out campers where the sides pop out to get like extra room and beds and stuff like they have tiny homes that do that like on like motorized things so like it travels and so it's because there's a max width that can be if it needs to travel. Sure. Because it has to be road legal. But by doing this, it expands and gives you more space when you actually set it up. But then uh, doesn't it, by definition, not become a tiny home? No, it's still very small. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and yeah, it's just really, really neat. So yeah. it's a cool show. And then I also watched Grand Designs, um, which I had watched previous seasons of. And it's still the same guy. And I still like him. I also think that he tends to sometimes... He doesn't... He doesn't say things to create drama, but he is certainly not shy about giving his opinion and, mm-hmm. like, questioning people on their decisions and stuff, which doesn't – sometimes can create some friction, but not necessarily, like, drama. Mm-hmm. Um, he just always – sometimes he says stuff, I'm like, dude, that's so rude. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, like, I don't know. It, it, it's part of – just what he does and i've gotten used to it over watching the different seasons and like they kind of rotate different seasons on and off of netflix uh like there was a grand designs australia that had a different guy that i didn't like as much but this guy's from uh great britain uh i believe um but yeah i I like him he's really smart and he like and then all right so i will say like kara and i also on like a recommended youtube video was this one guy who was going around to tiny homes and like interviewing them and it was just like this really good looking dude he looked like a cw actor this really good looking (laughs) australian dude with this like long curly brown hair Uh like really well built wearing a plain black t-shirt and like jeans and like i don't know not crocs but whatever stupid sandals or whatever he's wearing and he like went to this this these people's tiny home and like interviewed them and walked through it and, like, the tiny home was interesting, but he fucking added nothing. He was just like, oh, that's yeah. really smart how you've done that. Yeah, so, like, what's right. it like day to day? Like, he was just asking questions. He was adding nothing of value to it. Like, they could have just – he could have not been in it. He could have been off camera and the camera just on them and the house, and I would have mm. gotten the same amount from it. Whereas, like, watching Grand Designs – like, this was just some random YouTuber. Watching Grand Designs, like – he brings added value of expertise and like experience and right. like his opinions and stuff and not just like, Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> like shut the sure. fuck up. Pretty boy. <laughs> like whatever. Um, but grand designs is good. So that's what I watched. And then I'm reading Robin Hobbs's Farseer trilogy, which is very also super great. It was recommended to me by actually, a woman who was a friend of one of my friends and that woman also works with the friend i mentioned previously who was the master carpenter that they they work together and then you know what doesn't matter she recommended it she's very (laughs) smart and i trust her opinions and now i trust her opinions even more because these books are great robin hobbs farseer trilogy what's the uh, elevator pitch elevator pitch uh better than game of thrones Okay, it's not an elevator pitch. (laughs) (laughs) That's an opinion. All right, elevator pitch. uh, It follows the story of a bastard son who is the culmination of two different types of bloodlines that he doesn't come to realize until later in his life. Kind of the... the, um, Actually, still kind of hasn't realized the significance of it. I'm on book three. Um, but he's like kind of having to hide these because blo- one bloodline, the Farseer line, gives you access to what's called the skill, and that's like the ability to like quest out with your mind and like touch others' minds and like communicate with them, but also impose your will on them and like nudge their mm-hmm. mind in certain thought processes and things like that. Uh, and then he also has the wit, which is not really socially accepted. So it's like so you can like commune with beasts and other people with the wit. Like you gain like a deep emotional bond and like. Mm-hmm kind of it's the reason it's looked upon less than favorably is because 
legends say that people like turn into animals after a certain amount of time or like they become okay. beasts themselves because they're unable to resist the lure of like that kind of like a simplified whatever outlook on the world or whatever. So he has access to both of these things. Um, and so like they kind of like work in conjunction with each other and they're conflicting and all this other drama stuff. And so he's the bastard of, it turns out a prince and the prince dies. And then, so he, so his bastard is discovered. And so he's taken to this, uh, keep up, uh, out by the coast and that's where most of like book one and most of book two take place is kind of him in that area. And he becomes like an assassin for the king and other stuff like, I don't know, there's a whole lot of shit that goes on. It's, <laughs> a, it's a lot of like tangential politics, which I appreciate because Game of Thrones is a lot of like actual people playing the game and politics and stuff. This right. is more like he's living in this world and like trying to get by and occasionally has influence, but like doesn't know what to do with his influence and like makes mistakes and stuff. And it's more about, it's more about him and less about like the world happening around him. And it's only ever told from his point of view, Mm -hmm. which I also like, it's just a little more focused um, and keeps things a little more straight, but uh, it's very, very good. And I'm at a point now where like he, like the the level of growth for his character is like almost immeasurable at this point. Like he's just so different from the way he started. And she writes mm-hmm. a lot of she has him like reflect a lot um, on things in the past with like new insight, which is always really interesting. And, and yeah, and there's always like like little things come to find out like they mean a little more than you thought they did initially and stuff yeah. like that. She's very good about planting things early on. Um, uh, and then kind of uh, making them come to uh, like a satisfying fruition. Um, yeah, they're very good. That's Sweet. Robin Hobbs's Farseer trilogy. Mm-hmm. And it is then followed up by the Fitz and the Fool trilogy and then the Fool's Assassin trilogy. Jeez. Or maybe the Fool's Assassin is just one of the books. There's three trilogies. <laughs> I'm not well, positive. Well, that'll last you for another couple months at least. Yeah. I'm not positive that the third trilogy has the same guy in it mm-hmm. or not, but I know it has one of the same. Based on the name of the trilogy, I know that it's one of the same people. I don't know if it's the same person's point of view or not, but um, yeah. Really fascinating. Good world building um, without being too expository. Um, good good stuff nice well let's uh move into news see if we can bust through this we're running a little bit long which is good because a lot of new games and stuff came out it's good to talk about uh so telltale games is kind of coming back there is a new company called lcg entertainment that's made up of a bunch of old industry vets they've purchased the rights to most of the telltale properties not all of them um skybound games obviously still has the walking dead so there won't be anything walking dead related um, they have the rights to Wolf Among Us, which there was a planned Wolf Among Us season two, and they also have uh, rights to the Batman series. They do not have Guardians of the Galaxy and Game of Thrones, or I should say, it's unknown whether they have access to Guardians of the Galaxy and Game of Thrones thus far. Uh, both of those series were bad, in my opinion, when Telltale did them, so I would be less interested in them continuing those versus Wolf Among Us and Batman. So whatever. Right. They, they put out kind of a press release. They said, hey, they want, we want to keep the same episodic structure of these games, but we want to change the way the pacing works, which presumably would mean hopefully closer release dates, not like three plus months in between episodes, which would be yeah. a very positive improvement. Or and potentially they, like, I mean, I don't know if they'll go the binge model, but it would be nice. Like, even if they do want to separate them out into episodes. Right. Like, Yeah, they could be cool to like, hey, if we have a five-episode season, season, let's put them out like one a week. Let's make them all ahead of time and put them out one a week. That could could be cool. Similar to what they did with the Hitman games where it was like really rapid iteration on the episode structure. Right. Uh, They've already already offered some freelancing roles to previous Telltale folks. They're going to continue doing that, which which is nice. So like it being Telltale coming back, no, because it's not going to be Telltale, but these games have a way to continue, which could be a positive thing. And 
I know a lot of people were being shitty about this because it's the internet and saying like, well, why aren't they just hiring all the Telltale people back? It doesn't really work that way. Like, no, that's not how the world fucking works, you idiot. They're, they're in a different location. They can't just bring all these people back and do new stuff. So the key is like, it's a new studio making games. So it's still new jobs for people in the gaming industry. Right. How about we focus on the positive people? Yeah. Cyberpunk. No. <laughs> no. I steadfastly <laughs> refuse. Cyberpunk 2077 is getting a multiplayer component. No idea what it's going to be, but CD Projekt Red has said it yeah. will be coming post-launch. It will be a free update, uh, potentially multi-staged updates. I was theorizing potentially could do something like GTA Online or Red Dead Online, which is a much more ambitious approach to multiplayer. Um, that is but less that interesting to me than... I. I kind of want okay because I really liked what was it the twenty was it twenty twelve or twenty eleven syndicate game? It had really good co op. Uh huh. Um, like and they were just go, like, like mich- co op missions. Yeah, co op missions like encounters. It would be really cool if you could bring your single player character and go do like co op missions together. Um, that would be yes. really cool. I would also say it would be cool if you if they like have pre made archetypal characters or allowed you to make other archetypal characters because that's part yeah, of the yeah. the appeal of cyberpunk is there are so many different ways to play the game so many different class types which i use that loosely because they don't want to define classes but like being able to use your character in co-op scenarios that is cool but that also seems like an opportunity to be able to play a bunch of different class types if that makes sense yeah so almost like hero characters in a way but like a co-op story mission Hero but also with, with the characters. option to bring in your personal character. Sure, yeah. If it's not going to be competitive, if it's cooperative, then that seems like it could be realistic. Right. Because like everyone's going to want to show off their cool cyberpunk right. person, right? Yeah. I-, I think a like straight-up competitive multiplayer is not what this would be, because right. I don't see how that fits well if it's like a shooter or whatever. Like, that right. seems stupid. So I have to imagine it's some sort of online space or some sort of co-op experience like like you're talking about. We got a our, our biggest trailer yet for System Shock Three, which looks really good. Gives obviously obviously a lot of original System Shock and System Shock Two vibes, but very much like a lot of Prey, the recent Prey game. Yeah. But just really leaning into that horror sort of vibe, which I like. Trailer liked. was kind of weird. It was a little weird. Though. It, it felt very dated, like the the way it was like. Here's this like title card of information yes a rogue ai like, yeah it was, it was, it was of, pretty like, generic yeah. like the 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 on-screen text stuff was generic but the actual gameplay which they did show some it wasn't like a lot of it was just like walking down a corridor and you see an enemy and you're holding a weapon like not a lot right. of interaction there was a little bit of that but it lo- graphically looks gorgeous art design and stuff look amazing uh, but I keep forgetting that this game is is in the work. So right, well, because I keep thinking of the work that people are doing on the first System Shock, yeah, and like the trouble with development that that's had. That yeah. this, like, we've almost heard nothing about this. And who who is it that's making this? It's like Cornerstone Cold some, something. There was a an image at the end of the trailer. Let me find it. It was in the on the bottom other side. Other side entertainment. Let me see. Well, and it's being, I mean, it's being directed by Warren Spector still. So it should still have a lot of the same, you know, thematic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So other side entertainment. Uh, They made Underworld Ascendant and Underworld Overlord. Okay. I recognize the name Underworld Ascendant. Is that the one? Are they tie into the movies? No, I don't think so. Um, Underworld Ascendant, I think, is a game that is very much trying to recapture, like, classic RPG, like, dungeon crawly RPG, but mix it with some modern gameplay sensibilities. If I recall, I feel like I remember seeing some sort of, like, a develop developer interview mm. about that. Or maybe it was like on the Steam page or something. If there is a Steam page, I might also be thinking of the wrong game. But uh, that looks uh, yeah, action, action RPG. Yeah, I think I'm thinking of the right game. Like it has a lot of like um, ways in which you can traverse the environment and just like a lot of classic 
uh, fantasy stuff. So, I mean, if they're... So, I, I wonder, because it, it seems like they, as a studio, kind of their mission statement might be, and I'm putting words in their mouths, but just from my observation of the previous titles they've made, seems like they place a great importance on um, uh, revitalizing classic genres and, like, recapturing, you know, nostalgic magic and stuff like that. Um, and so I wonder if this System Shock 3 is going to be a modern game or if it's going to be more, more like throwback. the classic System Shock games. Yeah, it's possible. Than they're showcasing even, which I know like for people who like System Shock in a way that's similar to how we're happy that Borderlands 3 is kind of more Borderlands, maybe this could be a good thing. Right. Yeah, be curious to see more for sure. Yeah, uh, that was a little bit of rambling on my part, but I hope my point got across. I was also reading and stuff at the same time as I was talking, so I have no <laughs> idea if I good. made any sense. <laughs> well, we'll see more as it kind of comes together. There's still like no release date or anything for this game, so who knows if it's 2020 or even after that, uh, or pc only or if it'll come to next gen consoles etc right. i'm sure once it comes more to fruition it'll be an e3 type game i'm sure there's plenty of, there's plenty enough hype from the industry to, uh, to give that some like more triple a showing yeah and especially since like we have no word on another bioshock game as of yet well something yeah. something that at least shares some of those core tent poles in terms totally. of the classic franchise for it um is exciting Nintendo Switch Online has a bunch of SNES games available now, which is pretty sweet. Uh, 20 games are now available on Nintendo Switch Online. Some of the highlights, F-Zero, Kirby's Dream Land 3, Pilot Wings, Star Fox, Super Mario Kart, Super Mario World, Super Mario World 2's Yoshi's Island, Super Metroid, and A Link to the Past are all available, which is a pretty robust set of SNES games. Um, also, not part of the same announcement, but similar. Star Wars Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast is coming to Switch on September 24th, also coming to PS4. That is a very good game. And then they are bringing Jedi Knight Jedi Academy in 2020 to Switch and PS4. So I like always f- mix up the lineage of those games because the naming structure is so poor. Because yeah. Dark Forces is... It's like Dark... Is it Dark Forces Jedi Knight? Because it's Dark Forces came out in like the mid nineties and then mm-hmm. star Wars Jedi Knight two Jedi outcast is the sequel to that game or like in the same, it stars Kyle Katarn. Kyle as Katarn well. Yeah. But, but the sequel to Jedi Knight two Jedi outcast is called Jedi Knight Jedi Academy, not Jedi Knight three Jedi. So it's just like the naming structure is really, really confusing. And I terrible. thought Jedi Academy came out before Jedi Knight two. No, no, Really, and I, I think the the logic was that they were going to make like a Jedi Academy two, and so they didn't want it to be like Jedi Knight three, Jedi Academy two, you know, or Jedi Knight four, Jedi, you know what I mean? Right. So I think they just cut out the two from that sequel nomenclature. But it is it's just really confusing because Jedi Knight two Jedi Outcast came out in uh, two thousand two, Jedi Knight Jedi Academy came out in two thousand three was the direct sequel to Jedi okay. Knight two. Really terrible naming structure. And yeah. it probably wasn't clear even me talking through it right now. But I, I, for this story, I looked it up again just to make sure. Because okay. I had the same reaction. I was like, wait, Jedi Knight 2 is coming out this year and Jedi Knight 1 is coming out next year? That doesn't make any sense. But it's just because they, na- they changed the naming structure. Okay. Anyways, Jedi Outcast is a really good game. Yeah. Um, tr- another trailer for the Joker movie starring Joaquin Phoenix. This movie comes out soon. Um, so it's weird, like, hey, it's a trailer for a movie, but people are people have already like reviewed it and stuff, and it has like legit Oscar buzz for both Best Picture and for Joaquin Phoenix as Best Actor. Apparently, it's completely incredible. It's like a really slow burn type of movie. I still just don't know about this. Like, Joaquin Phoenix is a great actor, but I still watch this, and I'm just like, I just like, Why? I have a hard time caring. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'll watch it because it's supposed to be incredible, so I'm going to give it a shot, but I just don't care about it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks great, but I just, yeah, same. And it's, it's probably not fair because I'm, like, 
placing the sins of the larger DC Universe movies at the feet of Joker, which this movie has nothing to do with any of the other DC things. And well, they even yeah, said, but I mean, you ha- you can't take it exclusively on its own. I mean, you have well, to take into context like the fatigue. Yes, but my point is that none of the same actors, writers, directors, Zack Snyder had nothing to do with this. Like, it's its own thing. And so we should but be able to look at it with But that almost makes it harder merits. to care about because Maybe. it doesn't tie into anything. Well, no, because I don't give a fuck about what DC is doing with their larger universe building stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. I- I'm certainly going to watch it, uh, but I just I, I have a hard time... It's like why the it's like why why the Venom movie didn't hold any interest to me, and not because, like I don't dislike Tom Hardy. I I like Tom Hardy, and I also yeah. like Joaquin Phoenix. But I don't really care about either of those movies because, sure. like they don't tie into anything. So there's no real reason for me to care to go see them. You know, Venom was also bad though. Sure, to be fair. <laughs> but even if even if people were like, hey, Venom has Oscar buzz. It's really good. I'd be like, sure. I don't need to go see it. All right. Yeah, I get that. Although maybe now, maybe they'll tie Spider-Man back into Venom now that Spider-Man's no longer in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Oh, maybe. Can't wait for that shit. Uh, more Disney Star Wars stuff. They officially announced an Obi-Wan Disney Plus series. Ewan McGregor is in it. It takes place eight years after Episode 3, which makes sense because Ewan McGregor is in it, so it can't like be a prequel because <laughs> he's older. <laughs> right. <laughs> um like all the other stuff that Disney Plus has announced, their Marvel and Star Wars stuff, weekly episodes, not binge everything at once episodes. It's a bummer because people like to binge, but also fiscally it makes sense because if you put everything up at once, much like the use case you brought up, Kyle, like I'll just buy it for a month and watch all of it and then get rid of it. Yeah. Versus if there are 12 episodes, that's three months that you need to have it. Or you can wait until it's over, but then you've missed the zeitgeist and people have that FOMO. I'm okay uh, with that. That's fine. But there are a lot of people who will keep getting this because it's weekly instead of right. only getting it for a month. So, yeah, it's, I mean, cool. Like the Mandalorian trailer we saw, which seemed a lot darker than what we've seen from Star Wars stuff. Hopefully they could take this in a cool direction and not feel um, like they need to make it kid-friendly merchandising bullshit the way that the Star Wars movies have gone. Yeah. And then we got a first look trailer for The Rise of Skywalker, which obviously we've already had trailers for the movie, but this was more of a sort of reminiscent at the beginning where it was a bunch of clips from all the other movies and then kind of then it leads into some stuff about Rise of Skywalker. And then the big thing everybody's been talking about was that at the very end of it, you see Rey in Sith robes with her Sith eyes and a scar and she has a double sided red lightsaber they found another stupid lightsaber design that they can throw into a movie totally (laughs) um yeah it's difficult because watching this like i actually spent some time in the past week i went down a youtube rabbit hole of like watching a bunch of youtube videos shitting on the last jedi and how why it's so bad not even from a star wars fan perspective but purely from a like narrative story structure perspective, which are my primary complaints. I could go on and on about how that movie is utterly deficient and I cannot believe it got made the way it did when its B storyline literally is meaningless. We don't need to talk about this. I'm going to, I'm already starting, (laughs) but watching this trailer, even with my like zero faith in them ever making good star Wars movie ever again, it's still, I get caught up in the fandom and the nostalgia and seeing the clips from the original trilogy, even from the fucking prequels and stuff. Like just, I fucking love star Wars so much. It just gave me so many feels hearing the old school music. It's just star yeah, Wars is so magical. Cause I guess like the prequels are bad. They're bad movies, but there's still a lot to love about them. And so mm-hmm. I hope by the end Someday. of this trilogy, yeah. yeah, we can still look back because, like, at the time Episode 1 came out, there were a lot of people that really fucking hated that. Totally. Uh, but now, I hope, like, with time, that's kind of tempered and you can still kind of see, yeah. like, the good parts of it. And so I hope yeah. with time, like, that rosy glow, you know, comes back. I think The Force Awakens is perfectly fine. Yeah. It isn't great, but it's perfectly fine. But I would rather, way rather watch the prequels than watch The Last Jedi. Like... 
at this point, I am going to rewatch The Last Jedi before Rise of Skywalker comes out because I want to watch all eight of them before this comes out. Beyond that, I actively never want to watch The Last Jedi ever again. It is so terrible. So I, like you, hope that someday, once the pain is gone in a decade, I'll be able to watch all nine movies. And while it will still make me sad that they only made three great ones, unless Rise of Skywalker really surprises, at least it's still a full package. I don't know. You can hold out some hope. Some new hope, as they say. Uh, But it is funny seeing, like, the beginning of it is all about the original trilogy, and then it goes into, like, prequel stuff, and then it goes into current trilogy stuff. And so, it like, the arc of that trailer is, like, look how amazing these movies were, and then look how bad they got, and then, oh, God, how somehow did we make them even worse nowadays? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, to the actual trailer portion for Rise of Skywalker, there's a quick shot of a sky full of Star Destroyers, which looked really fucking cool. That's something that, like, I'm not going to criticize. The cinematography in all of the, even The Last Jedi and in Force Awakens, yeah. a lot of really fucking cool shots. Yeah. And that is certainly one of them. Um, there's a little sequence with C-3PO, where he has red eyes, finally embracing the villain that he really is. Uh, so it, just, it reminds me of the Dr. Afra comic series. Totally. Yeah. Protocol Triple Droid. zero. Yeah. Um, yeah. Trip. Uh, and then, like I said, the, the Ray's lightsaber is like Kylo Ren's lightsaber. It has that like jittery feel to it where it's kind of like, uh, unstable. Um, yeah, I don't know. I still prescribe to the theory that the rise of Skywalker is about, her abandoning the Jedi and the Sith and it becoming Skywalker, being the Force user, the light and the dark and both sides, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. Quick theorizing about the Dark Side Ray thing. A lot of people talking about it online. The predominant theory is that this is a Force illusion or projection or some kind of vision brought on by the memory of Palpatine, who we know is sort of a villain in this movie. Whether or not yeah. he's actually back, I highly doubt it. But some I mean, sort that of makes sense based on like the previous trailers with like Palpatine's yeah. voice. Yeah, and, and they, for some reason they go to the wreckage of the Death Star, and so there's probably some remnant Force memory of. Palpatine there. That's probably what the Dark Side Ray thing is. Obviously, some people who are stupid think she actually goes to the Dark Side. There's no fucking way that's what happens. But a really cool theory, which I'm not going to take credit for, but that I think would be cool, is that Ray is actually a clone. The whole thing about who are her parents and uh, Kylo Ren saying, Your parents were nobodies, you know that, blah, blah, blah could have this second meaning in that she doesn't really have parents because she's a clone. That's why they're nobody. Yeah. And that they were, she's a clone of some combination of Luke Skywalker and Vader and Palpatine and whatever, and kind of all that manifested into her, which is why she's so strong in the force naturally without any training because she has all this force ability from generations past. I think a lot of that is wishful thinking. I think a lot of it is justifying poor storytelling on Ryan Johnson's part of like, she's so good with the force with no training, trying to like justify that instead of the reality that it's just bad storytelling. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess like that makes sense though in that, like, uh, well, I get another point in that theory's favor would be that because Kylo and Ray can like kind of connect force yeah. lies with each other um they can do that in a way that's very similar to how in old canon how luke and leia can right. like sense each other very strongly because and jason and jana the, the right twins. And J- yeah jason and jana and so like there's this very strong like the force connects all things but if you're already connected by yeah like blood and genetics i feel like that makes the connection stronger so if because kylo is related to luke in like a half kind of way, quarter way. Well, it's his nephew. Yeah. 
and then if Ray was some kind of mix of Luke and whatever else, or yeah. even Vader, then she would share blood with Kylo, and so it would right. make sense that they could connect on that level. And I don't the, know. The big not tying to this is kind of two things, and the origin of her would probably be on Kamino, where they made the clone troopers, and it would be justified with, because Palpatine was the one that was behind all of that the whole time, and uh, the the theory is that he was also trying to clone Force users. And this is actually, would be a storyline sort of lifted from The Force Awakens, uh, or no, sorry, The Force Unleashed games, where you find out that Starkiller was cloned, and then in the second game you play as the dark side Starkiller, etc. So it would kind of be the same thing, where Palpatine is trying to create this, like, perfect dark side person, taken from pieces of him and pieces from Vader, because Vader, like, the Force can only exist in living things. And so when you lose aspects of your humanity, that force power diminishes. And so Anakin, pre-being burned by lava, was far more powerful than Vader could ever be because he had so much prosthetic robotics in him. And so by taking some of the genetics from Vader and from himself, whatever, and trying to create these clones could be a way of maximizing that force potential in another being that has all of its humanity remaining. And so I'm sure, like, there'd be lots of failures, blah, blah, blah. But the theory is, like, hey, this dark side ray you see is one of the clones who is actually a Sith. And somehow, good guy Ray got taken away or escaped or something and then was raised by Han and Chewie and then put on Jakku to sort of, for, for whatever reason, to accomplish her destiny, much like Luke was put on Tatooine. And so the reasoning behind it's Han and Chewie that raised her is that. In The Last Jedi, when she goes down into the kind of dark side force area and touches and goes into the, that mirror universe where there's like a long line of herself where she like snaps and it kind of goes right. down the line. The theory is that that is a representation of all of the clones because they are all doing the same thing as her, but not at the same time. Meaning that it's not all it's not all her. It's sort of like replicating her over and over and over again like a clone would. And then when she leaves the mirror universe and she's looking at it and there's these two shadowy figures that walk up, it's hard to see because they're shadowy figures and they're purposefully kind of morphed. But you could see how it could be Han and Chewie because one of them is walking with a gate where it looks like he has something on his hip. So like Han's blaster. And then the other one is much taller and sort of like lumbering and a little bit more amorphous like Chewie because he's covered in his hair where he kind of is more like a straight line versus seeing outlines of shoulders and stuff. So it's like, again, a lot of this is trying to thread stuff together, a little bit reaching on some of this, but there is a way to concoct a narrative to justify this. Yeah. I have two issues with these theories, even though this would be cool, but I have two issues. The first is that this is complicated if this is the reality and she is a clone and there's a lot of backstory that needs to be told of where she's from, how she was made, tying in the Camino stuff, the dark side Ray, like there's a lot of justification that needs to happen in this final movie that might be too complicated for a casual viewing audience to fully comprehend, which would lead me to, and because Star Wars is straightforward, man. Like there are always like the larger canonical things, larger universe building things that add intrigue to people that care but as a casual viewer, Star Wars is super surface level, which is fine, but it is. This is not a surface level thing. Talking about like the the cloning and the Force and like there's a lot of stuff that would need to go into expl- explaining this. The second red flag, which is excuse me, much larger, is that there was no plan going into these movies. It seemed like there was, but it is clear that there was not. Because J.J. Abrams wrote and directed Force Awakens. And then when Ryan Johnson came in, J.J. Abrams had a script for The Last Jedi, which Ryan Johnson threw out and wrote his own shit and did his own thing with no input from J.J. Abrams. And was very clear that he didn't use anything from J.J. Abrams' script. So whatever J.J. Abrams was trying to set up in The Force Awakens, Ryan Johnson completely abandoned. Which... Obviously, yet again, another thing. Fuck you, Ryan Johnson, for doing that. How do you think that's a good way to tell a story? And how fucking selfish 
are you to uh, fuck that guy? No one ever taught him the yes and. But the, 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 the relevance to this is that there would that would have needed to be the plan from the beginning. That Ray was a clone, and here's how we're going to slowly tie these threads together and justify it as the movies go, which I do not believe is has happened. So, is it a cool theory? I mean, yes. Like, there are parts of it that, like, oh, clones, whatever. Like, that can... That might also be kind of lame. But, is it, like, a cool, interesting theory that helps justify some of the poor decision-making in The Last Jedi and the poor world-building? Totally. But at the end of the day, I think it's very wishful thinking, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but we'll see. I still, you know, the theory of the, what the meaning of Rise of Skywalker is, that could be really cool. How Rey fits into this larger Skywalker narrative arc of, you know, Anakin and Luke and Rey, however that those pieces fit together, could still be really cool. I think J.J. Abrams is a good director. I don't think there was enough creativity behind The Force Awakens, but... I have far more faith in him to tell a compelling story to wrap this up in a cool way than I do Ryan Johnson, obviously. Yeah. So we're, we're on an upward swing here. But do I think that this type of intricate sort of fan fiction theorizing makes sense? I don't, unfortunately. But it would be cool. It would definitely be cool. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, we certainly will. Um... I was going to do a hate of the week, but we're, we're definitely running long and it wasn't a big deal anyway. So we'll skip that, save a hate of the week for next episode because we have two, count them, two emails. First from Aaron. Aaron writes, I know both of you like cars. If you could have one vehicle to drive, what would it be? This isn't limited like, hey, you can only drive this car. But like if you could choose a car to drive, what would it be? I have two answers. One of them is like a daily driver. If I had, if I could choose any realistic quote unquote dream car, BMW M5, it is a, the five series, which is their kind of midsize model to four door, but the M5 has a far superior engine, much faster stick shift. I would get it in slate gray, black leather interior, sexy ass car. If I want to reach more for the stars and get something that is couple hundred thousand dollars it'd be a porsche gt3 the bummer of a porsche gt3 so that's their like they do it's it's the street legal version of their racing car model so it's super fucking fast it has the the classic porsche 911 body style with kind of like the scoop rounded headlights it's very i love the the shape and the lines of it's so smooth that car but the gt3 is not a convertible and I feel very strongly that if you're going to get a Porsche, it needs to be a convertible. Dad trained that in me as a kid. So if I was going to go down a level from the GT3, it would just be a, a brand new Porsche 911. Classic fat fucking tires on the back. That baby hugs the, the road. Convertible. I probably, I could see doing like a canary yellow, which is like a really out there color. But it would look pretty sexy. But nothing wrong with classic Fire Engine Red or Silver, which are the classic Porsche colors. Those would be my choices. So, I like cars. I don't know shit about cars. <laughs> so, I'm going to I'm just going to describe what I value in a car. Okay. And Aaron or Shay or anybody else listening, if you want to shoot an email back for next episode to let me know what might fit this. I could totally help. I will probably be shopping for another car somewhat soon. Mm. So here's here's my thing. I like to be low to the road. I like to feel a connection to the road because I feel like I have better control. Mm -hmm. I don't like a big business class car. I like mm -hmm. something a little tighter. I like again. It. I think it comes down to control, feeling the road. Just my. Cause I have a '99 three series, and BMW. I have a. I have a lot. Yeah, BMW. I have a lot of control. Oh, well, I did before the suspension went wrong, but I had a lot of control over that car, and it just feel, well, felt great to drive. Um, it does not anymore. It, I feel like the wheels are going to fall off now. Um, I also, I don't like cars that have a lot of curved edges. I don't like cars that are too boxy. I think my car, f like, threads that needle perfectly it's just a very classic body style like the back is a little more squared off the front just has some really like 
clean lines that I really enjoy. I also I like my dark green color. It doesn't show mm. dirt as much, and not a lot of cars are that like forest green color. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's not very common. Um, I honestly, I would just like another one of my cars if <laughs> I knew the suspension wasn't going to give out. If I knew all of the inside, like accoutrement, weren't going to fall to fucking pieces. If the upholstery at the top of the car wasn't going to fall down. I know all of those things now about those cars. And it kind of ruins my enjoyment of them. But those are kind of the things that I value in a car. Yeah. Um, I also don't want something, like, not that I would ever be able to afford it, but I would never want a car that was, like, more than forty or fifty thousand oh, dollars okay. because I would never feel comfortable driving it. I yeah, would, like I don't want a car that I have to like park at the back of the parking lot because I'm afraid people are gonna hit it with their car doors. Like fuck that. That sucks. Yeah. I don't ever want to own anything that I'm afraid to own because it's too expensive or nice. Like I want to use my fucking car. Yeah, um, that obviously I want to drive it. That makes this conversation a little more difficult because then it's like regular cars it's not cool awesome cars right i would say like the obviously yet another bmw 3 series would do you well or even a 5 series but i would also say like a mercedes c-class would be nice because it's kind of it's not it's more smooth edged than the bmw is but it's not like super smooth the way that a porsche is it's kind of in the middle and they they definitely sit low to the ground and you can get like a base level one for mid 30s 40s So it's not like a crazy, super, you know, uh, crazy car. I will say just for the fun of the conversation, if you were going to get a supercar that fits that, those ideologies, it would be a Ferrari. Because my initial reaction was a Lamborghini because they're super low to the ground. They have that nice control to it, but they're very, uh, I would call it like fashion forward in design. Yeah, they're very like angular, very futuristic looking, which yeah, doesn't seem like, to be your thing. I don't like Lambos. And the Ferrari, while more round edged the way a Porsche is, it isn't as far as a Porsche. I do like a classic boxier Ferrari look. Okay, so yeah, so we're not talking new, but more like like a uh, '90s. Right, well, and that's my problem is I don't like new cars. I think yeah. they look fucking stupid. Yeah, I'm like, with they're you. They're all like organic angles, like, and I get it's for like aerodynamic reasons, but it's also kind of like a taste and trend has gone that way. It is over yeah. the course of time. I think it looks like shit. Yeah, like I think they look terrible, but I don't want an old car because they have problems. I want to fucking <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm sick of dealing with car problems all the time. I want I, at least like a couple good years out of a car where I don't have to worry about it. You know, my M5 answer is like a legit like one day I want to own an M5. I'm never gonna have a Porsche 911 probably or like a GT3 certainly, but I like legitimately want to have an M5 and. In a perfect world, I would want it to be like a mid 2000s M5 because that body style was perfect to me. The modern ones I like way less. So I- yeah. I'm totally with you that a lot of the cars that I loved growing up, like, and especially in high school and stuff when I was getting into cars, I like far less. There are certain designers that have always stuck true to the roots, like Ferraris and Porsches. They always have felt similar enough to what they've always done that it's still sexy. But if you go back and look at like, like a Porsche 944 or like, a, a, you know, an, a, even like an 80s 911 or something. Those are so much sexier than a modern day Porsche, in my opinion. So, yeah, I'm definitely with you on that. I have, I like the front end of like a Mazda 6 or a Mazda 3, like a mid to late 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, I just hate the back end. It's mm-hmm. like this big, fat, gross thing. Yeah, like, they do like, like a hatchback look on yeah. the, the 3s, I think. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, even, like, the sedan cuts of them or, like, the spoilers and, like, they just have those big round lights and just the back end gets so big and fat. And there's just, like, there's no definition to it. It just feels, mm-hmm. like, bulbous in the back. Mm-hmm. I don't know. They look really bad. Um, but I like, I kind of like the front ends on the Mazdas. Uh, sure. I, I tolerate them. I see them driving <laughs> down the road and, like, I see one driving at me. I'm like, that's a pretty nice looking car. And then I look after it. And I'm like, oh, that's a terrible looking car because the ass is bad. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my conundrum because my car has probably only got like another year left at most. I would like to start looking for a replacement next summer, but mm-hmm. I don't know if funds will permit. We'll see. Well, cool. Thanks that's Aaron for the answer. email. 
Yeah. Um, Steve wrote in. Steve says, Shay and Kyle, you both get to decide the four launch titles for PS5 and Xbox 2. Parentheses, working titles. It is not going to be called the Xbox 2, but I kind of hope it's called the Xbox 2. I hope it is. (laughs) The Xbox Uh, 2X. Each system only gets four titles. The (laughs) 2XL. Each system only gets four titles, and you both have to agree what they are in one final completed list. To make this more fun, the titles aren't supposed to be predictions, but more what the two of you think will make for the strongest launch. So keep in mind what you would want to play, slash what fans would want to play. Anything goes. For some fun, let's say Nintendo comes out with four games at the same time for the Switch. Collaborate together, but also push for titles you feel strongly about. Thanks for all the content and looking forward to your completed list. Steve in DC. Um, yes, so this, we both kind of thought separately about this, and combining the idea of what would I want with what would both realistically be able to happen based upon development times, and what would realistically happen to bring in a broad audience, made this a much more difficult thought experiment right it's not just what do you want it's what would make a strong launch yes totally because like because it's easy to say here are the games that i want to play on it but also that means no sports games no racing games like that kind of stuff fighting games would not be represented which are huge market moving opportunities for these consoles so i guess like to start let's start with the playstation 5 okay um horizon zero dawn 2 I think is should be a lock for this list. That makes it sense. Fits into that open world RPG nature. The first game was phenomenally successful, both critically and commercially. They can really show off the graphical prowess of the PlayStation Five because of the environment diversity, the kind of nature of the gameplay that you're chipping off these pieces of the enemies. Like that's something that was not possible on the PlayStation Three and is now possible on PlayStation Four, and you can go even farther with that on the PlayStation Five. And I just think it's like all around would be a really solid launch game for that console because of the story and the characters and the world and the gameplay. It's just a really great game that presumably will be even better in a sequel and I think would fucking knock that launch out of the park. Yeah, and then I think to fill that slot, if not Horizon Zero Dawn 2, it would need to be God of War 2. Yeah, and I guess part they, of that... they would kind of fit some of the same requirements. Right. So I don't want to say both of those as part of the four, but I one think, or the other, I think. I think that God of War 2 could be on the list. I think the difficulty for me thinking it, like trying to be realistic about it and thinking about exclusive games and development times... That game coming out in 2018 would make it really hard for me to believe that the sequel could come out in 2020. So I would say like that to me makes the tiebreaker in the advantage of Horizon Zero Dawn. But I could see God of War 2 also making the list depending on what the other options are. Yeah, I think we should set aside the realistic time frame because that's not really part of Steve's email. He's just saying what would make the strongest launch. Yeah. So I, and anything goes. So setting aside time frames, like I guess. Yeah, and I know that was part of the question, but that to me makes it, makes it a little too open ended because then it can be like literally any game or any sequel to anything. And I don't know. I did that. That becomes a little too broad, in my opinion. But, but we can like, come back a, to that. Also, like we we need to think about things that are going to be relevant. Yeah. And so that's going to be things that are maybe a little closer or have had releases or at least like a public consciousness presence yeah. in the past few years. Um, for both the PlayStation and the Xbox list, a first-person shooter has to be included because it's the predominant genre of games. My pitch would be a new IP first-person shooter from Insomniac because they can do like what they did with resistance they can still play with the cool gun types they can tell a unique story in that way i don't know what the game would be and frankly i I don't really care i have faith in that studio to make something cool but that that would be my pitch for the first person shooter sort of represent representative on the list would be from insomniac did you have other sense like if they were to reboot or kind of revitalize um resistance could be something in that vein, or like we talked about this last episode, I think. But uh, if they had something new, I agree with that. I think if, if there's going to be a first person shooter, I think that would probably make sense because it's such a big name that I mean, 
I and just like thinking would, about the first party studios seller. that they have, like there's a limited number of, of yeah. exclusive games that they can do, uh, unless we like really broaden it to third party exclusives, which to me is more of a last resort. I want to try to make this as much exclusive stuff as possible. So what, yeah, uh, did you, yeah, that makes the most sense. What else um, did you have for uh, PlayStation? Uh, a new Uncharted or a new Last of Us? Oh fucking duh! Why didn't I yeah. even think about that? Yes, that has to be there. Last of Us Two. Let's let's call it that. The Last of Us Two has to be on this list. It it would be either one because like I mean let's say like if, um, if because Last of Us Two is coming out on current consoles, so I don't know that we could really say like well oh, we don't know great. that it'd be we don't know that it one. is didn't they say it was coming early twenty nineteen or nope. tr- early twenty twenty I mean uh, sort of but they've said. they've talked around the release dates a lot and again coming uh, back to the nature of this list like what would make the strongest launch if we assume that the Last of Us Two is not coming to PS four. It will. It will okay. only come to PS5. That has to be, and, right. and I would. I would choose that over a new Uncharted because it has more of the well, serious it, storytelling nature. Yeah, and it's been longer. Yeah, that too. And like be- comparing it to Horizon Zero Dawn, Horizon Zero Dawn has more of that like middle of the road attitude toward it, and like open world adventure sort of thing that right. Uncharted taps more into versus like really gritty post apocalyptic character focused storytelling. Right, and then the Insomniac is you know you're kind of like lighthearted, quirky. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and define that then, because because if it like I know you had said resistance, and I'm not as big of a resistance person, but as a compromise, do we think that if it was like something more in the vein of Sunset Overdrive, where it was more of a humorous first person shooter, do we think that that would be a good fit? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, especially, like, if we're looking at the other things that we have. Yeah. You need something with levity. Yeah. And I've, Insomniac's in a position to be able to pull that off with their team, so. Okay. So we've got Horizon Zero Dawn, which hits our, like, open world RPG elements. We've got The Last of Us 2, which is our story-focused, more linear, narrative-driven game. And we have a sort of humorous first-person shooter from Insomniac, which is going to be over the top, more bombastic, lots of different gun types. So we're not hitting on a lot of the more broadly liked genres like a battle royale or a sports game or some sort of or competitive or game. Because presumably, like, like let's go ahead and say this, this first person shooter from Insomniac, it has a storyline, but it has competitive multiplayer. Let's go ahead and make that distinction. Um, okay. Even if you and I aren't going to want to play that, that's something that I feel like probably needs to be represented. Yeah. If I was going to pick a fourth game, maybe... In terms this, of a strong launch. This might not be the best fit because the game has had such long legs already. But trying to fit into that like online, competitive, sports style game would be a sequel to Rocket League. And okay. that might not be a fit just because they've supported Rocket League so long. Like I don't know that you need to make a Rocket League 2. But that's just what pops into my mind is like a fourth game that is different than... Like, far more different than what we're talking about. Because at the end of the day, all three games we're talking about here are, like, combat-focused or shooters, like, that kind of stuff. Right. Well, I mean, if if we're trying to focus on exclusives, Rocket League would not be an exclusive. It could be. It could be. Rocket. The first Rocket League was an exclusive for a while. It was a timed um, second-party or third-party exclusive. That's Yeah, it could be. I was going to say... because they kind of like they kind of ruined a lot of the community goodwill with the last Gran Turismo if they were to bring Gran Turismo back because like we need like a racing or sports game on the list if they were to bring back Gran Turismo and it was still more Mm simmy I I guess that just it doesn't have as Gran Turismo never had as much of a broad audience as like a Forza just because Gran Turismo is more of a a sim as opposed to an arcade style. Um, but may- maybe maybe there's options for both in that so game. So would, would, would they do it more like what they do with the, um, not the actual Forza games, but like the Forza Horizons, the Burnouts, yeah, where it's more of like an other... open world kind of? Like right, what they, yeah. they tried or, to or do like... that with... Uh, Shit, what was that other open world racing game that was a PlayStation exclusive that was like really broken the club. and got delayed a bunch? Drive Club, yeah. Drive Club. So like like Drive Club, but actually make it good. <laughs> right. 
Uh, yeah, Drive Club with the Gran Turismo people behind it could potentially be successful. Okay. Um, I, I, I like that. Because I, I don't want to just put down like a FIFA or Madden or whatever because it's totally exclusive. Yeah, yeah. And that's I'm what try, I was trying, trying to, to think get. Of exclusives. I was trying to combine the like racing and the competitive stuff with Rocket with a sequel to Rocket League. Right. That's not a bad. That's not a bad idea either. Um, um, so I guess as the tiebreaker between those, like, what would you probably rather play? Or what would make you more excited? Would it be a new Rocket League? Gran Turismo. A I don't give Gran a shit Turismo. about Rocket League. I don't play competitive okay. stuff, so. Well, I would say for the sake of this being a launch game and being about building a community and showing off new features of a console, I would say this Gran Turismo is going to be, it's going to have like, a, a lot of social... Yeah, social components, more of an yeah. open world structure than it just being like, pick your race, pick your car, pick your track, you know what I mean? Right. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good fit. I think that's a solid list. I probably would not be super interested in playing that Gran Turismo game, but I could appreciate it, and I think yeah. it makes sense to round out our list. So we have Horizon Zero Dawn 2, The Last of Us Part 2, a humorous first-person shooter from Insomniac with a competitive multiplayer component... And then a new Gran Turismo game that has more of an open world social community building component to it. Right. And even if it doesn't have an open world, it would have to have some sort of a social space, possibly Destiny-like. Okay. Um, and just like extensive social systems and like it would just have to have a lot of cars. And something that Gran Turismo never really did was a lot of damage modeling on cars. It, yep. it, it would need to have something like that. And I know that like, car companies get really touchy about that well, because they're all this is our idealized. It, but like, this is our idealized version right. of it. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's fine. Okay, that's a solid list for PlayStation Five. I would buy that console <laughs> if these four games were coming to it at launch. <laughs> Probably <laughs> buying it regardless. Well, sure. Xbox Two. So these, I have two that are obvious that have to be on the list. Halo Infinite, which we already know is going to be a launch game for the next Xbox, Project Scarlet, whatever. That ha absolutely has to be on the list. That fills our first-person shooter component. That fills our beloved franchise coming back component. Uh, has competitive multiplayer component. I would also posit that there has to be another Forza game, which I know is like not as exciting because they, always, like, they do a new Forza game every one to two years. But as a showcase for graphical fidelity... They right. always make the like little tiny quality of life changes, little changes to the systems. This time with ray tracing. Yeah, I, you know, I would actually argue that I would prefer to see a Forza, um, not Motorsport? a no, not the regular Forza Motorsport Horizon, a new Forza okay. Horizon, because that has more of a fun attitude to it. There's right. a little bit, it, you know, those social components that we're adding to the Gran Turismo franchise. I think that that is probably a better fit. Um, I also had uh, a new Fable game. Love it. That would be yes. a big. That would be a huge drop. Um, that'd be Fable Three, yeah. Or Fable Four, four. yeah, yeah. Or some sort of a reboot or whatever. Yeah. Um, so ha is, Halo gets our uh, gritty first-person shooter, competitive multiplayer. Forza's racing with a little more levity. Mm -hmm. Fable 4 is kind of your goofy third person action RPG. So, but to the Fable 4 part of the conversation, is it just a single player RPG? Or does it have a Destiny like vibe to it where you can play it as part of a party? Or, yeah. You know? That would make sense. I mean, especially if, if we're, well, because it seems like the way things are going, um, Social integration is huge um, and is a big focus right now and probably going forward for maybe ever. So, yeah, I mean, that would make sense if, like, Fable 4 had some sort of um, co-op uh, capability. Yeah. Okay. Do you have anything um, else? I also had, I know this won't happen, well, probably wouldn't happen now, or it wouldn't be with Insomniac, but a Sunset Overdrive 2, because um, mm. the first one was really successful on Xbox, and people really liked it, and I know this is like pie in the sky, un unless Microsoft, well, Microsoft might own enough of Sunset Overdrive to be able to have another studio do it, but 
I feel like that's not a horrible option. But also thinking about how Microsoft tends to market with, like, they're very zeitgeist forward thinking. Um, I'm wondering if, if there were like a Fortnite two. Mm. Or a Minecraft 2. Minecraft 2 was my going to be my other potential option there. Yeah. I don't know what the hell that game would be at all. It doesn't right. to me it doesn't make sense to make a sequel to Minecraft other than to just make more money. Right. But honestly that would be my pitch. Because Sunset Overdrive 2, I like that because it is the like it's a third person shooter and we only have one shooter on this list, which like that's what people want. But the 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 name Cache isn't quite there because that game was definitely a moderate success. It wasn't like super popular. Um, to me, a Minecraft two would be an absolute showstopper. Yeah. And even though I don't know what that game would really be, I would be really really excited to find out. Yeah, and I guess like it would have to be because the problem with Minecraft now is that when it was made it was never intended to be what it's become totally and so there's a lot of i'm sh- i'm sure i don't know but i'm sure there's a lot of uh like weird back end stuff they have to do and like they work within this odd framework to get things to do a certain thing or act, behave a certain way so like the ability for them to kind of start ground up with something new clean slate here's the pitch no Man's Sky, but Minecraft. Different no Mind planets. Sky. <laughs> no Man's Sky. Different planets that you can go between. It has actual like space stuff. Not as complicated as No Man's Sky has become with like building ships and all the different components and etc. But like think about the core gameplay loop of Minecraft of this like really simplified but infinite building capabilities and like different resource management etc yeah i'd like to see open ended some nature. actual tech progression like yeah not a lot of mod packs do but like yeah. something kind of first party from them right that they deem is like simple and clean enough to and and you keep you keep the simple graphical style which right. should make it a lot easier to like execute this but, but it's it kind of like, like a... shaders and all that yeah kind of, yeah like you have all that because i know they were working on getting uh, uh, shaders working on Minecraft and they gave up on it. So, like, maybe this is something they reserve for a Minecraft two. Yeah, that would know. be that would be my my election for the fourth game. Minecraft two, uh, we're taking a lot of learnings from No Man's Sky with the multiple worlds that that sort of thing. Make it make it galact Minecraft but galactic. Yeah, and everybody, what people are make people make is connected. So it's one like how No Man's Sky is one big universe. Hmm. Everybody's worlds, you can just like go to different people's worlds to see what they're doing and stuff. There, it could get messy with permissions. As an opt-in, but conceptually, as an opt-in, like yeah. like like with Minecraft, where you can have a server with a bunch of people on it. That's right. how I would pitch it. Like it's yeah. not it's not part of the core experience. You can it can be played completely solo because I well, it does need to be infinite because that's part of the charm of Minecraft is that right. it's infinite. But the scale of that infinity doesn't need to be anywhere near as large as what No Man's Sky was. No. Okay. And by the way, I've written down Minecraft 2, and I did it Roman numerals, II Minecraft 2, which is how Minecraft 2 should be. Not the number 2, but the Roman numeral 2. Do you agree? Um, I think it would be Minecraft 2.0. Fair enough. Because, okay, yeah, fine. I'm good with that. Because right now they're on version 1.14. And so yeah. I think when they hit 2.0, it would make sense that, oh, it's a new game that is 2.0. Has all the stuff, but we've recreated it to accommodate for this new system, this new thing that we're doing. And it's only available sure. on Xbox One uh, right. or Xbox Two and Windows Store. So, rundown of our <laughs> Xbox Two lineup. Halo Infinite. With it, which has our uh, competitive multiplayer, Forza Horizon, which has a bunch of social components in it, a Fable 4 single player RPG, but it also has like maybe Destiny influences with some co op capabilities, and then Minecraft 2.0, which takes Minecraft and puts it on a galactic scale. Another really fucking solid launch lineup, I think. So, yeah. because they want to be part of the party, 
Nintendo Switch is also putting out four games at the same time. The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2. Duh. Duh. A successor to Super Mario Odyssey. Like, whatever the next 3D Mario game is. Duh. Duh. I would say we need something that is nostalgia capturing. And I would want a new 2D Metroid game. See, I said the new Metroid Prime game. Yeah, I just feel like, okay, we can we can have those as options, and then we can figure out what else we have, because there needs to be a classic gaming experience as part of this. Because Breath of the Wild 2 is a big open world game. Whatever the next 3D Mario game would be, would be some sort of big open Mario game. So we need something that is far, far tighter than what Metroid Prime, I think, will be. Actually, instead of a new Super Mario Odyssey follow-up, I think the answer would be a new Paper Mario instead. Really? No, I don't yeah. think that mo- that, that does not move the needle like a new core Mario game. Like, yes, think? but a new, a new Paper Mario would be great. But it's not the same. Like, th- look at the other lists we've made. Like, these are all the biggest heavy hitting games we can come up with for these consoles. Yeah, I guess. Paper so. Mario does not rate. I guess I just I tried to capture two and one with more sure. of a classic feel and That's a Mario. Fair. But so what else did you have? Other like because it seems like we're we're a little caught on what form Metroid would take, and I think we can make that decision based upon what the fourth game would be. I do not have a fourth written down. Okay. Well, if we look at... I mean, similar to what we did with the other ones, let's look at the types of games. So we have two big open games that are nostalgic series. Right. A potentially more classic version of a nostalgic series. So then we need something... a first-person shooter. Well, So either we need another classic or a first-person shooter. Well, because I I was going to say... We need something that has a multiplayer component to it. A Splatoon 3? Exactly. That was going to be my my one. Because it's not... It's it's a newer franchise. It's online. It's multiplayer. It's social. That would be my number four game. And then I think that informs where we would do that 2D classic Metroid. Which, if there's a right. different game that isn't Metroid that we want to do the classic vibe to, but I think Metroid's the best fit, and because it's been forever. Like, if we want... Like, I would say, hey, Mega Man, but, uh, you know, we are getting tons of fucking new Mega Man games anyway. Right. Um. Yeah. Because I guess, like, it'd be great to have another, like, Mega Man Legends game, but that's not going to move systems the way these other ones would that's just something that i would want yeah well Um, are you are are you cool with the 2d side scroller metroid because we don't i mean we don't have a first person game it it would sell a lot it would sell a lot it would but i think a 2d uh, yeah yeah I, i was gonna say a metroid prime would also sell a lot but I think that people would want more of a 2D game in comparison yeah, to the other I, I games think, on this list. Right. If, if we're talking about in uh, taking into account the other games, it, it's it's Nintendo. You need something that harkens back to old Nintendo because yeah. that's what people want and expect. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that makes I think that makes a lot of sense. All right, so that I think we have. So our Switch list, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2, a if it's Super Mario Odyssey 2 or whatever, a new 3D Mario game, a 2D side-scroller Metroid, and Splatoon 3, which I think is also, again, really great list. So here's, here's an additional question that should be fun. If you can only get one of these, and these are the only four games that you can play on this console, which one would PlayStation it be? PlayStation 5. Still? Yep. Because that the difficulty for me there is I'm not interested in that Gran Turismo game because then I'm only playing three of these games, but I, yeah you're probably right. Like yeah. I don't care that much about Horizon Zero Dawn two, mm. and I don't care that much about Gran Turismo, but Last of Us two and a first person shooter from Insomniac <laughs> yeah. outweigh everything else. That's and true. man, I love Halo, but you know what? I still have Minecraft and I have my mod packs. And yeah, because that because I, I was never crazy about Fable, 
Right. I'm not as big on Fable, but it being, a, you know, a single player RPG has a lot of appeal to me. Horizon I, or Forza I obviously wouldn't care about. I don't care about Halo, but if they're making it this bigger open universe Destiny style game of Halo, that is appealing just in the gameplay part of it. And Minecraft 2.0 sounds fucking awesome. So that, like, Minecraft 2, of all the games on this list, Minecraft 2.0 would be my number one game I would want to play. Over Last of Us 2? Yeah. Last of Us 2 would be the second game. That's messed up, man. Dude, it's fucking Minecraft. Think about Minecraft, but No Man's Sky. That's yeah, fucking awesome. Yeah, but we awesome. already have Minecraft. I know, but and just I thinking still about the regularly. future, right? Whatever, yeah. <laughs> but I'm probably with you. I'd probably still choose PS5. Because Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2, like, I certainly wasn't as high on the first game as most people. Yeah, I mean... Um, Splatoon 3 wouldn't really appeal to me that much, other than it being, like, a cool multiplayer thing. Right. So, yeah. But hey, man... If, if these four games were announced for these three consoles, I would want to buy all of them. I'll say that much. Yeah. All right. Good hefty episode. Let's wrap it up with something that we don't hate. I'll say that I do not hate that football is back. I'm so fucking psyched. I love football season. And we're going over today, actually really soon. I need to log off because I need to shower. But we're going to go watch football because it's Sunday. And I'm excited. Nice. Uh, I don't hate Thanksgiving and Christmas breaks. Which are still far away. Yep. Just that you need them. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I am working. I am site managing. I am taking classes. And now I am directing a show. All at the same time. And it's a fucking lot. <laughs> I, I was very happy that I got sick this week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I wrote a script for myself for plugging both sharing of the podcast and the website. So I'm going to read it so I can instill in myself a habit of doing a good job as a host. Is this while, is the music going to ramp up while you read this? Um, probably is, not because I don't have a long enough start. I don't have a long enough clip of our like outro music to <sighs> fill the whole period of time, but we'll see. I'll play with it. The Shea Hits Everything podcast is a product of SheaHitsEverything.com, where you can read reviews, rankings, and opinions on video games, movies, television, books, comics, and other shit that matters. If you enjoyed the episode, remember to leave a review, subscribe, and tell your friends. I hate it. (laughs) Alright, that's it. We'll see you guys back in two weeks. Peace out.